Hello everyone, welcome back to Ask a Scientist Gaming, where we combine mediocre gameplay with expert science. I'm Ken Hansen, Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Florida State University. I'm a photochemist slash photophysicist, which means I like to shine light on molecules and see what happens with that light energy, whether it be catalysis, uh, photocurrent generation, or making and breaking of bonds. Um, but more importantly, joining me today is Dr. TJ Rorabau. TJ, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yeah, so I'm uh, Dr. TJ Rorabau. I am also a photochemist, photophysicist, so I like to shine light on molecules as well to do interesting properties. But I am currently a research chemist at the U.S. Combat Capability Development Command Army Research Labs, or DEFCOM ARL for short. Uh, currently, my research is focused on nonlinear optical properties of transition metal chromophores. So similar in a sense, we like to shine light, but uh, for different properties than solar cells or photocatalysis. Yeah, so you're you're particularly interested in Department of Defense type problems. Right? Yeah, so we're solving army problems with transition metal photochemistry. Yeah. All right, equally important. What game are we starting with? We're gonna start with Mario Kart. It's one of my go tos. Let's do uh, it. <laughs> yeah, I, this is one of the games too that like, you know, online play is really good. Uh, I, a lot of nights played with uh, friends from high school, my family members, especially during COVID, as a way to keep in touch. So it's one of my better ones. So we wanted to start off with that. Yeah, let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. What's what's your go-to character in this? I don't know why. I just like Toad. <laughs> you know, he, he's light. He's got a good fast. acceleration. Very you know? fast. Yeah, so I always go with Toad. Um, don't know why I chose these uh, settings. It's kind of just... it's superstition at this point. Yeah, right? really. At this point, I, I, I've done it all. So I don't I don't know if we have a a favorite go-to circuit. But I'll just start with the first one. Play a Grand Prix, and then we can move around. Yeah. Right. No, sounds good. And this is, when did you start your Mario Kart journey? Ooh, I mean, Mario Kart started with me when I got my first DS, mm -hmm. so handheld, and that's yeah. when uh, online gameplay started too. That was a big thing. Which one was that? That would have been Mario Kart, I don't know what the oh, name was. It I don't remember like the five number. Or something yeah, but it was like a while ago. So I was, I was in high school, so it's a time, time away. Yeah, we'll give you some time to settle in. All right. I'm gonna just adjust the volume if you guys want to hear some gameplay. So are you feeling the pressure? Oh, yeah. <laughs> in front of an audience. It's easy to play video games. It's hard to play video games in front of an audience. Yeah, Even it is. You know, um, when you have to talk science. Won't yeah. You? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a mix up from just trash talking friends. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, but feel free to rage. We've had people uh, rage quit. <laughs> so maybe not in this game. I'm... Yeah. This one's pretty gentle in general. Well, you still play this one pretty regularly. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, um, tried to in the last few years to play more with friends, um, just as a way to like catch up. So talking during is is pretty normal. Yeah. For me, but yeah, um, of all the games I I play probably the most that are like not campaign based, it'd be this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been focusing a lot more on like Tears of the Kingdom, mm. uh, which is more time consuming because I. Uh, I just can't focus on like a single task. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just like constantly go off into other things. You do every side mission and. I yeah, I've been playing probably like I probably put in over twenty hours in it, and I still haven't done like the main campaign. <laughs> You're one of those people. Ah <laughs> uh, yeah yeah. Uh, no, it looks like an amazing game though. I'm I'm a big fan. Uh, I'm also really uh, happy that they uh, kept the same map because I kind of remember where things are from uh, Breath of the Wild. But I'm happy with the changes they made, so it's still like a different game. Yeah, I was going to say, like, the, the infrastructure of the map was the same, but the aesthetics and everything, mm -hmm. they updated. Yeah, yeah, so uh, a little bit of the gameplay and stuff is different. It's like your powers are a little different that you gain throughout the game. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. It's a victory. It, it, it is, yeah. I mean, you can get the Bowser <laughs> GG. If you want to see chat, you can watch it right there, but... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have a few of our own emotes, <laughs> including, no, no. <laughs> including Osha and Carl Sagan. Oh. So, yeah, just for fun, you know. Oh, yeah. That's what yeah. we're going to do for emotes. Billions and billions. <laughs> billions <laughs> upon billions <laughs> upon billions. <laughs> Non-Dairy Neutrino, welcome back. It's good to see you. It's been a while. 
Yeah, start of the semester last week for people at FSU, which is right. kind of crazy. So any students in the audience, welcome back to FSU. <laughs> it's great to have you guys. Any new students in the audience, welcome to Ask a Scientist Gaming. <laughs> <laughs> it's I've been busy I'm sure just like everyone else yeah we, we don't take it personally this is a casual stream show up when you can drink on a Wednesday night if you so choose <laughs> um, it's to each their own but yeah yeah I've heard uh, parking was really bad yesterday yeah there was I saw like I, I, I keep track on reddit like people were regularly post the FSU reddit and it's like I drove around for 45 minutes and couldn't find a spot so I left and skipped class <laughs> like ooh, <laughs> that sucks Thankfully, my class is at 8 a.m., so very oh, little. yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, it's good for me, not great for the students, because they shouldn't be doing classes before 10 a.m., but who wants to listen to the research, am I right? Yeah, I will tell you this, though. Like, that was, like, the biggest culture shock about where I work now. Yeah. So I'm in the D.C. metro area, so uh, traffic is awful. Um, so a lot of people will get there super early. So I'm talking, like, 6 a.m. start time, wow. 6.30, yeah. For a, t a time, I enjoyed a 6.30 start time. But that means you got to leave early. Yeah. It's just really trying to beat out traffic. Yeah, that makes sense. And the battle for us is like the daycare window and lining that up with classes. And, yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, it works out okay. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, it did just hit five here, so I guess it's time. Oh, yeah, West Coast time. We try to start the stream as late as we can, but yeah, 8 to 11 is about as late as we can go East Coast time, so... Yeah, sorry for the <laughs> non-ideal time window, but you can watch a little bit at work, apparently, so oh, yeah. <laughs> enjoy it. All right, yeah, if anyone has questions, uh, our, our guest today is Dr. TJ Rohrbau. Uh, he's an uh, expert at photochemistry, photophysics, works for the Army Research Laboratory. I'm not going to say the whole name, nor yeah, would I get it right. Army Research Lab is we'll, good, yeah. say DEVCOM R A R L. yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, he's happy to answer questions about experience there, uh, what it's like to work there, job opportunities there, but also his research in optical limiting materials, nonlinear optics, molecular photophysics, and photochemistry. So yeah, should be should be pretty fun. But before diving into any questions, we'd like to start with our question that, you know, obviously six-year-old TJ didn't think I'm going to be playing video games, talking science in Tallahassee, Florida, right? right. There's a Very long true. convoluting path yeah. that took you to where you are today. So the question is, what was that path and what were the major milestones along the way that like really changed your trajectory? Ooh. Yeah, so I was just starting from like more of a beginning, but like, you know, like high school age is when they start telling you to, to think about what you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I distinctly remember this junior year uh, English class and do a mock interview for your like future job or college application. That was like the, the thing they did at my high school in, in wow. Westmont Hilltop in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And at that time I interviewed to go to college for a uh, history teacher job, like mm -hmm. degree in history or social studies uh, to teach history. Uh, obviously I am not doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of things changed. Um, about one of the biggest moments for me in high school is I did scholastic scrimmage which is like a quiz bowl. Mm, okay. And, and why that was a big thing is the, the coach uh, for that was a chemistry teacher. You know, I did really well. I, I was on varsity in my, my sophomore year. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep you on point. Yeah. No, no, no. We got to keep playing the games. Yeah. Um, entertain sorry. the masses. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, sophomore year, I was on the varsity team. Uh, and then all throughout the years, I, I started getting better. I was a captain my senior year. Uh, I liked the uh, teacher a lot, so I took his classes, which was chemistry. Mm. Uh, we were on block scheduling, so I was able to do multiple chemistry classes in a year. Did chemistry my junior year, uh, then advanced chemistry, and then organic chemistry my senior year. Wow. Uh, yeah. I'm so impressed was, they had that available. That's, yeah, that's unusual. It was really great. I mean, it was like intro. So we did a little bit of like reaction mechanisms, mainly did a lot of naming, just simple structures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nothing too crazy, but it was something that made me like really realize like, oh, I really enjoy chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to that, but I also still wanted to teach. Um, so I went in a secondary uh, education in chemistry. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, I changed that after about a semester uh, because one of the professors there who I had for Gen Chem was like, hey, if you're really, you really like doing chemistry, you should try research. And you know, worst case scenario, you get a master's degree and you can teach at a community college if you really want to teach. Um, and I think that's still like some of the best advice I got. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I ended up switching to like just straight chemistry, started getting much more like the higher level understanding, doing undergrad research, and really fell in love with like 
doing synthesis. I really like making things. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, I actually, my free time, I do a lot of carpentry, woodworking. Oh, nice. Type stuff. So, uh, Any cooking? No, I, mean, I cook. I don't, yeah. I don't think I cook well. I do most of the cooking. <laughs> I mean, that's all chemistry is, right? Glorified cooking. Yeah, uh, so this is like the weird thing, right? Like, synthetic chemistry is very equivalent to, to baking. Mm -hmm. And I don't like baking. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like 100% yield. Come on. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's great, but taste is not, not yield. Yeah. So I'm not that's really fair. good at, at that type of very, very precise baking. I'm not, yeah. Not, yeah. It's not my thing, you know. I do that a lot at work. I don't need to do that at home. No, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so anyways, uh, undergrad research, which if anyone out there is interested in the field, especially in, in STEM or STEAM, if you're able to do any undergrad research, uh, that's probably the biggest thing that will tell you if you should go and pursue a graduate degree. Because if you... Oh, oh. yeah, yeah. You ain't got me. Um, because, you know, if you don't like doing the research, going to grad school is not going to really fix that because it's all yeah. grad school is. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's advice you give to No, that, here. that absolutely is it. Like, you might find out you hate it, you might find out you love it, but you have to know before you go to grad school. Right. If you can. Not everyone has that opportunity, but hopefully, either an REU program or undergrad research, I, I fully agree with that. Yeah, assessment. and and so I went to a small undergrad, so I went to a PUI. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's Pitt Johnstown, which is a branch campus of Pitt in my hometown. And uh, it's 3,000 students total. Wow. Uh, just to give you an idea of how big the chem department was, uh, when I took PCHEM lab, I was the only one. <laughs> solo. Yeah, solo, solo PCHEM lab. Um, I did well. Yeah. Yeah, they graded on a curve, so I, I did well. It worked out. Yeah. You, yeah. Were, you were average, to I be was, fair. <laughs> super average. Right yeah, middle right. of the road. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I did undergrad research, and I was also able to get an REU. Mm, um, that's a big one. Return, uh, research fellowship at uh, Duquesne University. Which is still a smaller school. Um, it's like uh, downtown Pittsburgh, private. Um, I did that with uh, Thomas Law Pin Tower. Uh, so I did, uh, you know, more synthesis, some interesting stuff there, and catalysis work. Um, just more cementing that I liked grad school because I was like full time research. Mm -hmm. So are you scholarships? That's like a really good way to get a, a, what a grad student goes through in a summer. Mm -hmm. um, and just again cementing that that's what I wanted to end up doing. Um, then you know, Junior oh. kicks around. I know. Oh. Well, oh. if my friends are watching, uh, one <laughs> first happy birthday, Luke. If he's out there, it is his birthday. Well, you have and, first time chats from yeah. Jenna Baker. So it says, Hi, Megan. Megan? I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, first time chat from Gavin1800. What's up, man? I'm assuming uh, that's someone that knows you. That, that is. Uh, yeah, don't get embarrassed by my gameplay, bud. Yeah. Yeah. But welcome to the stream. Thank you for joining us. If you're not following us, click the follow button. One, it helps with visibility. And two, um, you get internet points that we're going to spend gambling on science questions later. So, yeah, follow us. Thank you for watching. Um, but, yeah, sorry, TJ, you applied for... Oh, Jenna, thank you for the follow. Thank you for joining the Ask a Scientist gaming army. <laughs> Slowly growing. Uh, all right. Sorry, we were talking yeah, about right, so, grad school is the next step. Yeah, so... Um, you know, I think one thing that's really intimidating for people who go to small schools is applying to grad school. Like, you never know, you know, are you good enough? Are you compared to undergrads from larger universities and stuff? But, um, you know, one of the things that I got a lot out of at undergrad was hands-on experience with research, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, I did a lot of tutoring, even did supplemental instruction, which is similar to uh, TAing. Of course, so like doing like a recitation, mm -hmm. um, which I think was helpful for like building up those chops and maybe made my application better. I have no idea. You know, you never know these things as a, a student, right? I mean, along those lines. So I was I was at a PUI as well. I didn't know you got paid to go to grad school. So oh, anyone that's not yeah. familiar with that, if you go to chemistry, physics, biology, even psychology and engineering, they will pay you to go to grad school, and so you don't have to pay tuition. You actually get a salary. And I honestly didn't know that until I was like yeah. a junior. That's actually a really good point I didn't mention. So I'm first generation uh, mm. college student. So me and my sisters all went to college, um, but my parents didn't. So when we first started talking about grad school, my dad was like, oh no, am I gonna have to take out a second mortgage <laughs> on the house? Like, how's that gonna work out? And yeah. and yeah, being tuition paid for and then getting a stipend on top of that's a, a big part yeah. of grad school, especially for the, the STEM STEM fields. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Oh.
All right, so you went to grad school, Claudia Toro, worked on I, some ruthenium complexes. I did, yeah. So, yeah, sorry, we get yeah, derailed. So, anyways, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah under, undergrad, I did ruthenium uh, catalysis. Mm. Uh, so, uh, ruthenium salt horse complexes. Um, and so, I knew I liked doing synthesis, especially inorganic. Um, though, organic synthesis is still a very important part of that. Most mm -hmm. people don't realize that. You're still, I, I like to say I'm a lazy organic synthesis <laughs> uh, guy. So, if I make a new ligand, Usually it's an easy, like one or two step. Yeah, a known crazy. procedure of some kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sidefinder yep. is my best friend. Um, <laughs> exactly. And then, so I really like doing that kind of synthesis. Uh, I applied to Ohio State. I actually didn't know much about Claudia's research. Um, most of my mentors from undergrad, who actually one of them went to Ohio State, uh, she was an organic chemist. So she's like, oh, we should work for like this person and that person. And I was like, I don't know, I want to stay in, in organic chemistry. Yeah. Um, Sorry, so before we get too derailed, should I just do like some some 200 and get you, get crazy? You I mean, you just crushed it at 150. I know. I, yeah, the, the 200 is like, I don't remember to break. That's the problem, <laughs> going around turns. I'll, I'll, I'll do I'll do some. Oh, it's like the new ones. I haven't done this. I can look really bad because I've never done these, actually. <laughs> You're going to try 200 on one you haven't played? Let's do it. Yeah, I think that'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. If anything entertaining to everyone else. Oh, wait, nope, can't do that. So this one, they remastered a bunch of old maps, right? Is that? Yeah. Well, we yeah. do this one here. Because they took, yeah, like yeah. DS games and Game Boy Advance and everything. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So you've probably yeah. seen some of these before. I've seen some of them. Oh, actually, so I, I, I do not have the DLC. So we we're going to go back to the other original ones. But 200, I'll probably fall off the map like half the time. So at least be entertaining to everyone. <laughs> Um, but yeah, anyway, so I wanted to make sure I was still doing, um, inorganic synthesis, uh, and Claudia's group, I met one of the grad students at a poster session at the visitation weekend, which are very, yeah, see, yeah, really important to, <laughs> uh, to attend as a grad student. The visitation weekends are pretty fun. Um, I remember to talk while I'm doing this. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, you can settle it a little bit. You don't have to talk the whole time. In fact, there's a question, uh, first time chat from 814 Law. What's the application process like to get into grad school? 814, you should come back and join us November 1st. Actually, every year we do a, uh, a, a Twitch stream with the graduate admissions uh, committee chair at FSU Chemistry, and it's a live Q&A just asking questions about the admissions process, about applying, about how to pick groups, how to pick schools, which, like TJ was saying, is very, very important. Uh, and it turns out I am the graduate admissions chair at FSU Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, so I will be the guest on my own stream, and Justin Kenimer will be the host. <laughs> so I get to play video games on that one. Oh, you see, that's a, that's a big turn of events there. Yeah, I'll do some NARC, oh, <laughs> some, yeah. some Mutant League hockey. <laughs> but 814 is short answer, uh, application process. I mean, it varies, but basically Basically, you need a, what is it, CV, cover letter, uh, three letters of recommendation. They used to require GRE scores, that's much less common now. Yeah, I think that's really good. Um, yes. I'm actually a really bad test taker. Yeah. Um, so, like, my uh, my verbal skills were actually very poor. Um, me, because I'm, I'm a slower reader. I'll, 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 I'll blast out the, uh, my, um, my uh, failings in terms of that. Uh, my been successful. My Shout out to the slow readers of the yeah, world. Yeah, my chem GREs were actually my highest of all of them. Yeah. Yeah. I was similar, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my verbal was the lowest. I have a feeling that that chatter's verbal was also their lowest. Yeah. <laughs> non dairy neutrinos. So the periodic tables have periodically turned. Yes, I will be the guest on stream, but uh, yeah, 814, it's, it's, I actually have a YouTube video I should link to. Um, I have a lot of YouTube videos, actually. I, I basically take any presentation I've done to an audience or a crowd. But it's, the, the name of this one is called the um, Graduate School Demystified. And so it's actually my cradle to grave walkthrough on the graduate school experience, uh, the application process, what they look for, so I I um, what people are interested in. Uh, sorry, let me get this. Sorry to distract. This is where uh, no, no. the journey takes us. Throw, throw all the all the links so, in there. Yeah, eight one four. Check out that YouTube video. I mean, it's fifty three minutes long, but it's literally everything. It's it's not only like applying to grad school, but it's also the graduate school experience. It's very FSU centric, but I mean, most of us had a very similar experience. Yeah, imagine, so. I think the crazy thing. So my my wife actually has a PhD in biology. Mm -hmm. uh, we both went to Ohio State. We met in undergrad, mm -hmm. um, but then we're both uh, fortunate enough to get into Ohio State. You know, mm -hmm. the Ohio State. University and uh, when I intro you tomorrow for a seminar, I will not say it. the. Oh, you won't. Yeah. 
just, just to piss off Claudia. No, yeah, I no, she, I don't she cares. Care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll be sure to make sure I'm, I'll say I'm very happy to be at the Florida State University. Uh, giving I was actually more nervous for uh, this than I am for the talk tomorrow, but I probably should be more nervous for the talk. I mean, it'll be fun. No, you should be nervous for the Friday talk, because that's the whole department. You're not making it easier. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah, tomorrow, so, uh, <laughs> tomorrow's will be relatively easy. Small audience, smaller audience at least. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, we detoured a bit. So, so you're deciding on groups, which one you want to join. Mm -hmm. You narrowed it down to body and a few different people oh, yeah you yeah so um oh geez back back to talking about myself yeah my wife would say this wouldn't be a hard task for me so i'm surprised it's a little more difficult but i guess gaming adds to it. um anyways uh so yeah claudia um she i mean you've interacted with her she's yeah. just a phenomenal person very um you know easy to work with and mm -hmm. a, you know a name in the field so I was very fortunate to get into her group, and you know, one of the things too is that, like, um, you know, being able to do that, like, synthesis side of it, really design molecules, um, you know, try to push the limits of like what ruthenium, you know, chemistry can can do. I, I was really excited about that. Um, so I, I thought it was like a perfect fit, you know, for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's very difficult. I feel like. Um, um, you know, picking that right group is not always what happens first time, which yeah. you see that every now and then you have kids change groups and stuff, but I, I really just, I think, meshed really well with the people who are already in the group and, um, you know, we're already uh, doing research I really like. So. Third's not bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know you were going to bring it up. <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping track of both things. I'm just sitting here watching some chat, listening to, to your life story. Yeah. <laughs> Might as well watch some video games. You're tied, though. That's. I'm, I'm, I think I'll, I'll still pull it out. I've got, yeah. got another race. I can mm. come more. I, can... I should probably um, move my body out of the way. No, they don't need to see the placement. <laughs> no. They don't I'll need to see where I'm at, where I fit. <laughs> All right. They won't so, be surprised at the end. So Claudia's group, you did research, you graduated, you were looking for what the next step in life is. How did you... Ooh, yeah, so I would tell you, like, one of the, the biggest points there, like, the equivalent to, like, knowing I wanted to go to grad school was, like, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And everyone always talks about academia or industry. Um, you know, when you're a grad student, mm -hmm. most of the talks you see are, um, are like the speakers that come in, they're either, you know, well-known academics mm -hmm. or they're, um, you know, industry people. And we didn't really have a lot of government lab, uh, researchers come through as mm -hmm. much, but I'll tell you, one of them was by a guy who I actually just saw again at a conference that uh, is a researcher from AFRL. And uh, he came and just gave a talk about like what it's like to be a uh, scientist at a government lab. And I was like, that is exactly what I want to do because they're still benchtop scientists. Yeah. They're you know leaders in their fields. I think respectively, a lot of the times, that's what the, the goal is to pick people who are you know very technically proficient. Mm -hmm. um, and, but what was really appealing to me was like, I still got to do the bench top research. Yeah, I still yeah. got to be a... I actually got your hands dirty. Yeah, I still got to do the synthesis and stuff. And I mean, like, this is no shot at grad students and it might just be like trust issues that I have. But I mean, like, when I find a synthesis that I'm like, this is going to work, I want to make sure that it, it works. And I don't <laughs> know, like, if it, if it fails, is it hands or is it, you know... Yeah, because it's inherently flawed, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which I mean is like a, a common thing that like organic synthesis people will say is like, oh, in our hands it, it was like a 100% yield, which I'll do. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> not exactly what they uh, say but they're the thinking it. but yeah they're thinking it <laughs> i've seen i've seen reported literature says it's a 30 percent yield but in our hands we got it up to 80. i've seen that before in papers so yeah but i'm not an organic chemist like i said i'm a lazy organic chemist so yeah um, do yeah. you want to give a shout out to the speaker that changed your career path yeah so that actually was uh uh, Matt Diggerson, so he's a AFRL scientist, mm. and the way he just described everything, yeah, I did drop the four. Mm. Ooh, yeah, not not tied for first anymore. Yeah, um, it's not bad. Uh, I might be able to pull this You're out still in it. if if that guy catastrophically fails. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that was like a big moment, and so I, I got to see him. We were at a, a meeting, and it's like, hey, you know, like that was actually really impactful for me, and that, that was that was really nice. Because 
I'm very happy with where I'm at. Mm -hmm. um, but and actually, the mechanism of getting the job. So um, every national lab. So if you're looking at like DOE labs or Department of Energy, they have a careers page with postdoctoral postings and all that stuff. And so I was hitting refresh every day <laughs> uh, in those last like six months of my PhD. It's like, all right, it's spring, my fifth year. I'm gonna just start applying for whatever and just see what sticks, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I was like looking at Los Alamos, um, Oregon, of course, um, Brookhaven. You know, those like different national labs, um, and then uh, someone who I've met multiple times at conferences, like you know, IAPS, or the Inter-American Photochemistry Society. Oh, nice. I don't know how that. Happened. Nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> Take that. Yeah, you know, any day. Um, so, uh, so I met Ryan O'Donnell. Oh yeah. Right, which is um, one of my now, uh, you know, cohorts in at the lab. Um, you know, he's given a couple of talks at, especially in um, inorganic spectroscopy, which is a section at ACS National. I don't think it is anymore. I think it's like inorganic coordination chemistry and spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, I'm sorry. You're just getting uh, beat up here. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to catch up. I, I got I these guys in front of me. I think. Oh, speed strat. Trying. <laughs> Alright, I think this is actually more luck, but I'll just kind of fall. Oh, yeah. wow. We'll, we'll take no, it. That was take beautiful. It. We'll take we'll it. Take yeah, he fell in third, so did I? I think oh. you take it. Oh, oh, oh no. no. <laughs> ah, that's rough. Anyways, I um, so I was looking for jobs, and there was one I was actually in competition for at Los Alamos Labs, making redox flow batteries, mm. um, which is a lot of synthetic, organic, and inorganic chemistry. So it was like really up my alley. Um, but the um, guy I was in competition with could start earlier, and so it took him to timing, timing yeah. so much timing. Timing is huge. But it actually worked to my advantage because I emailed Ryan like the week after, and I was like, "Hey, man." We met at a few conferences. Do you have a postdoc job opened up, or if, you know, for someone who does synthetic chemistry? And he's like, funny thing, our postdoc actually just left for a job at Los Alamos. <laughs> uh, yeah, really? yeah same it's guy. Same guy. <laughs> so shout out to Gabe moving back to Texas, wow. the Texas oh. area. So oh, Los okay, Alamos, New Mexico. He was from say, Texas. So. Los Alamos is kind of middle of nowhere, but yeah, if you're close well, to the family. Yeah, exactly. And I was, I'm, you know, being from Western Pennsylvania, much closer yeah. to family than uh, New Mexico. So I'm, I'm very happy with how it turned out. That's nice. Um, not happy how this uh, last cup turned out. So A14 not... Law is a question uh, regarding that decision making. What have you mm -hmm. found to be the biggest benefit of your job versus a career in academia? And what are the cons? What, yeah. what are the pros? Let's start with that. <laughs> Yeah, so I think a, a lot of the, um, I guess, should I do one more thing? Yeah, it's up to you. We're, we're a half hour in. It's, it's we're a half hour. I'll, I'll, I'll burn out my my best game for a little bit. Um, that wasn't bad. You were second by one point. I know. But 200 is also yeah. like hard because you're, like, you're falling off the map half the time. Yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll go for 200 again and just, uh, yeah, that's a fun one. Um, so I get the, what, there's a lot of different ideas to like academic labs versus in like being in the government lab um and then being like different government labs are also very different mm -hmm. i think it's like being in the dod lab we're a little more uh applications based even though we do a lot of basic science mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say we don't do basic science but we always have to have that idea or application in mind yeah. um, so when things don't work you kind of just scuttlebutt uh projects yeah i think is that the term for like sinking the ship yeah, yeah. so if things aren't working and then I feel like in academia, a lot of times you want to figure out a little, a little more about the whys and hows, really, really like conceptually. Mm -hmm. Which I mean, sometimes like for what we're doing, like it's very important to understand how things work. Uh, but getting to like the super nitty gritty of, pro of projects that aren't working, like it's not really that important. To us. Um, I think what might be trying to be brought up by that chatter is maybe more work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the weirdest thing when I started my postdoc is that I had a desktop computer. I could not access my email or any of like the, I mean, we have Teams now. We didn't have Teams when I started. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I wasn't able to access that from home. Yeah. And so like, when I left the lab for the day, I left the lab for the day and I only worked 40 hours a week. It was like That's very crazy. different than answering the, uh, you know, occasional 10 p.m. email like, hey, I need this yeah. or, uh, uh, you know, a. Uh, a grant or a publication, you know. 
And that's like your wet work in lab. There's there's an interval, right, where they shut you down. They don't have safety people on staff, or is it just your 40 hours a week that's fixed? Um, 40 hours a week uh, as like a, a, it's fixed. We also have flexible scheduling. Um, this is something that's actually toted by a lot of like the the, the labs, like especially if you're a, a um, civilian employee. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, you look at like all the rules. You basically follow OPM. There's the Office of Personnel Management for federal employees. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different um, schedules you can work. So we have some people who are compressed, which is four tens. So four days a week, 10 hours a day. Oh, wow. Uh, so they yeah. get every Friday off. Um, when I first started, I did a, a maxi flex 980, which is nine days out of two weeks, 80 hours. Mm. So you're basically, what that ends up being is nine hours a day, except for one Friday's eight hours and every other Friday's off. Nice. Which is very nice. So in uh, contrast, academia, yeah. when I started as an assistant professor, my wife started keeping track and it was 70 to 80 hours a week. Mm. And it's, I mean, it's a very different thing, right? Because like I'm my own a boss, right? Yeah. And like I, if it goes forward, it's because I'm doing it, right? Mm. And it's, it's, yeah, it, but it's not necessarily healthy. <laughs> yeah. So work-life yeah. balance, not so much. Yeah. And I'm actually like in a um, position where, you know, we can build extra hours so if i end up working instead of an eight hour day working a you know, 10 hour day i can bank those two hours oh, I see. and use it for another day so i can be like i'm gonna take a half day mm-hmm. i've worked enough you know which is it's super nice i will say for like work-life balance which is actually pretty new so for my my first child to so my daughter i did not get uh parental leave i was able to use sick leave but i was pretty new so i didn't have a lot so i got I two see. weeks um, but recently, in the last few years, they passed um, the parental leaves. Um, they, I'm sorry, they didn't pass a bill for it, but it was snuck into like an omnibus bill mm. where uh, you got 12 weeks off for uh, parental leave. So when my son was born, I had 12 weeks. That's awesome. Which is it's very nice. I still check the emails every now and then, but yeah, you know, not having to stress about work it was nice. You know, I think that's something that. I would hope that that goes over into more areas, you know, outside of just government. Mm-hmm. I think academia, a- academia is getting more forgiving on parental leave and FMLA yeah. and things like that. That's good. I, th- I think too, like with, um, you know, if you're able to do, you know, an online class or something like that, they increase flexibility for that, you know. So. Okay, so pro work-life balance, you're always a reasonable. They, they shut you down so you can't do stuff at night, which is great because you can't answer Gen Chem mm-hmm. student emails at yeah. 10 p.m. at night. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. any students in the audience. We do our best, but we get a lot of emails. <laughs> yeah, you don't have a 5 p.m. cutoff. Well, yeah, I'll get no, it tomorrow. Absolutely not. <laughs> it's on my cell phone, and I see it immediately. Oh, and yeah. it, it haunts me until I answer it. <laughs> I do not miss having work email on my phone yeah that no, is the it's, nicest thing awesome it's <laughs> something i should shut off but like some of the work emails i care a lot about you know oh, like they yeah, matter a bunch, a, especially a student emails and things like that yeah. all right so that's a pro so what's the cons what what, what, what what do you miss about academia i want to tell you this is like the the major thing is like ordering in academia was so easy mm. um at least at ohio state the ohio state university <laughs> we had uh like e-stores so it was like you would log into e-stores and then it'd be like, do you want to go to like Fisher or Sigma? Mm-hmm. And then you would go to the website, like through a portal and then just like you could shop for whatever you wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you go to checkout, put in a grant number and you're good. Um, it is a much more stringent process to buy something mm. now, which is like probably my more pet PV thing. But it's not as bad. I mean, like instead of being able to instantly order something and get it delivered in three days, it, it takes like two weeks, which is fine. And of course, for the oversight of the, um, you know, the government, we're using, you know, everyone's taxpayer dollars. So obviously, we want to use them wisely. Having checks and balances are a good thing. Um, but I will also say it is. You know, when you have an idea and you want to like get rolling on it in the lab, you want to like tomorrow, not two weeks from now. I mean, is that what it is? It two weeks or is it? What's your turnaround on? Oh man, if I, I it's probably a little longer than two weeks. Hmm. Um, but turnarounds enough. I mean, we keep really busy. Um, so being like nitty gritty, like I need this chemistry tomorrow. Like we have more than enough projects to work on that we don't. Yeah. Um, but I do miss being able to have that like luxury of just like quick, super quick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The flexibility. I imagine the the safety restrictions, good or bad, are also much looser in academia. I, I would, yeah, I would probably think that um, 
we have really good safety staff, very concerned for longevity, <laughs> um, you know, research, especially because, like, this is career-based. Uh, um, sure, you're doing a lifetime. Of- they're they're starting to, to do that a lot more, mm-hmm. looking at how, like, what are long, long, like long-term exposures to certain chemicals that we're routinely using? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm very thankful for that as a synthetic chemist. You know, yeah. As you know, like the yeah. life expectancy of a organic chemist is a little lower than a theoretical <laughs> chemist. <laughs> well, um, especially, I mean, 30 years ago when you were washing your hands with benzene, right? Uh, like... I mean, that's the only way to get cold dust <laughs> off your hands. So. Exactly. <laughs> Oh man, sorry to laugh yeah. at that, but that's very real. Oh I no, mean, they, they especially had... like mouth pipetting things. Oh yeah, mouth eh, pipetting my mouth is yeah, not okay. But I mean the, <laughs> the hand washing, um, you know, benzene. Mm-hmm. So I came from a, a coal town, uh, steel mill town. So yeah. Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, uh, is the location for seminal films like Slapshot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, if you're into hockey and also uh, yeah. all the great I'm from moves. Minnesota, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think yep. actually uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania beat out a, a town in Minnesota yeah. for Hockeyville, USA. Sla- uh, Slapshot is actually the Hanson Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is. Sense, yeah. it exact, so it's based off real people. So the yeah. uh, Carlson Brothers, yeah. my cousin is married to one of their sons. Wow. Yeah, I have, baby, world. I have babysat. Um, his grandson. <laughs> that is amazing. I, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Did you play hockey as a kid? I, I, I played pond hockey, not formal. Like, my high school uh, wasn't yeah. big enough to have an actual hockey team. So, How yeah. big was your high school? I, my graduate graduating class was 100 students. So my town, oh, okay. my town was 1,600 people. Yeah. But I still grew up within walking distance of three hockey rinks. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very nice. Yeah. yeah, in my hometown, we had... Uh, technically two. So we had the the warm the no jeez, I'm gonna say wrong. The war memorial, mm. uh, which is I think based off the it was a Korean War memorial. I don't know why they called it. Um, and then there was Planet Ice, which actually closed. Mm. But that's where I played hockey a lot of my life. So I played a good amount of hockey growing up. That was my sport. So you're still I, a hockey fan? You know. I, I am a hockey fan. I watch a lot more college football now. Ah. Uh, because there's less, less games. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I'm doing so bad. Actually, I'm second, though. Okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Oh, this, this is, like, the worst thing for my potentially ADHD brain. Right you know, <laughs> that's, that's part of the fun. Oh, yeah, You're getting right. knocked off your ivory tower of scientific elitism by sucking oh. at video games. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, like, oh, man. I, I tell you, like, one of oh, Come on, have enough room. Anyways, um, it's weird though. Like I think um, in terms of like being, I think one of the things like you know, do you have like I made it moment? I feel like you know, especially kids my age, a lot of like the imposter syndrome still. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it's hard to like, you know, express that. Like, do I feel like I actually mm-hmm. am an expert? Like, you know, when you introduce me as an expert in photochemistry, it's like, oh, it's like I'm really an expert. <laughs> you know, but yeah. it's one of those things that, like, you know, it, it hits everyone. Oh, yeah. Um, I think at some point, I'm sure in academia, it's a very humbling. Oh, yeah. No, every yeah. transition, like, tenure process, every award, it's like, when are they going to figure it out? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. It's not great. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the things that, like, alleviates it, at least in my field, is, like, I'm on an interdisciplinary team. Mm-hmm. So, currently, I'm the only synthetic chemist. Yeah. So, you are the expert. I, yeah. I am the expert in synthetic chemistry, even if I'm not good, actually. Yeah. So, <laughs> Better I, than I, you. I, <laughs> yeah. I I really enjoy synthetic chemistry. Um, yeah. I really like what I do. It's, I mean, you can't beat it. I mean, all the pretty colors. Yeah, I don't know. absolutely. Um, glow but, stuff. I like yeah, it. Go, shine a black light on it like you're showing samples today. Like, yeah. like glow, it's, it's neat. Um, so that's like one of the things uh, that was interesting about being on an interdisciplinary team solving problems is that like you are now an expert, which is so strange. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. When people turn to you for that knowledge, yeah. No, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so there's a follow-up on one of those dialogues. Uh, chemistry re. Chemistry re? Any discussion on school year rhythm versus fiscal year? Uh, priorities as a government PI. I mean, so hiring, that has to affect you a lot, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Hiring is uh, pretty rough. Um, for So for postdoc positions, they're kind of ruling. They don't necessarily matter. Uh, for hiring a government employee there needs to be a slot and Mm -hmm. so timing is everything Mm -hmm. uh if there's a hiring freeze that affects a lot um stuff like that so like rhythm also they might be more familiar with uh fiscal year versus academic year 
So we run fiscal years October 1st, October 1st. So we're actually going to be entering a new year for government employees, a you know, new fiscal year in the next month. Uh, and so that affects funding, spending, uh, when we're uh, actually going to... Sorry, I'm not playing. <laughs> yeah, keep going. All right, I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll do one more Mario Kart. Sounds and I guess good. We, we can move on if that's... Is that yeah, well, sounds okay. good. Yeah. Um, I mean, so we ran into this issue because TJ and I have a collaboration and we're, we're sending a student out to you. And it's yeah. like, when does the timing of semester align with when you guys can do it? And I guess summer is the easiest for, for this particular round, but... It's hard. And not, not yeah. only that, you have to deal with semesters for some schools and then quarters for others, yeah. <laughs> right? And then your fiscal like year. A lot of schools are moving away from that. So Ohio State used to be quarters. Okay. And when I joined, like started there in two, uh, 2013, which is 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, you're telling me. <laughs> I've been at FSU for 10 years as of oh, this summer. Man, I'm telling you, when when Facebook memories notify you, it's like, hey, first day of grad school 10 years ago. It, it makes you feel a little, oh, just, a, just a little bit. Yeah, here's my favorite one. I hope some of my students are in the audience. This is the first year where the students in my Gen Chem class will be the same age or younger than my Yahoo Mail account. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I think uh, one of the age things that was like funniest. Um, so, uh, my 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 brand sheet who's like my supervisor. Yeah. Um, I am in between the ages of his daughters, and so oh, I am the youngest. Wow. I'm the first person to be younger than his oldest daughter to be working for him, which I think is pretty uh, interesting. <laughs> that affected him. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but man, yeah, ten years ago, I was like such a different person back then. It's yeah. so crazy to think of like, where I'm at. No, exactly. Uh, Time do you, flies. Do you ever, uh, you know, you go to conferences and see people from grad school and just kind of reminisce about the oh, old days? No, absolutely. Yeah, I just had that. Colleagues, collaborators, who are going to like give talks at their universities. And they're like professors now. I knew you when you were a lowly like <laughs> postdoc trying to get by or grad student doing your first experiment. Oh, like, yeah. Man. <laughs> we're getting old, man. Yeah, we're getting old. Yeah, I, I feel like I, sometimes it's so funny. And it's like, you know, you know so I've been, I've been working in your lab for like the week, which I'm, I'm very thankful for, uh, you know, that opportunity to do that. And man, I, I've, it's so weird being in a new lab because I just haven't done it in so long. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, oh, I feel like such a child. I don't know where, <laughs> Amateur. I don't know where anything is, you know. Yeah, yeah. Or what the, the procedures are, or the social oh. niceties, and yeah, like it's a yeah. whole new culture. Yeah, 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 which everyone has been tremendous in your group. So th thank you. It's been a really good uh, atmosphere oh. to come in and, and work. So. Now I'm glad you could come down. This is, it's been a lot of fun. Oh, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I love the the uh, atmosphere of the town is very nice. Kind of reminds me of like a state college at Penn State. Yeah. A deal, you know, a little little city around a, a big university, which there actually are two here, which that's my own fault for not knowing that <laughs> yeah. Florida AMU is also in Tallahassee. Yeah, and we have uh, the Tallahassee Community College. And so it's, it's weird. It's, it's a college town, but like three months a year, it's also the state capital, right? Where yeah. you have all the politicians. So the dynamic changes a little bit and the traffic does, but you're right. It does have a college town feel despite being 250,000 people, which is kind of crazy. I guess yeah. the national, the high magnetic field lab contributes to that. So. The mag lab does, which is actually very nice that it's like located so closely to a research institution. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Oh, it's been great to have you. All right, if you guys have any um, any questions, our guest today is Dr. T.J. Rohrabau. He's uh, happy to talk about photochemistry, photophysics, color chemistry, light interacting with molecules, and what you can do with that, particularly related to Department of Defense goals. And so, yeah, he works at uh, Army Research Laboratory. Um, it's in, what is it, Adelphi? Uh, Adelphi, right. um, but it, it, it's just outside the Beltway in D.C. So. Okay. And there are actually multiple locations across the country. Mm. Uh, Adelphi is the technically headquarters. Uh, a lot of uh, labs are also in Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Uh, but we have satellite facilities throughout the whole country, um, west, central, and south. So you may hear of a professor who's working at like Houston, who is also an ARL employee, mm. uh, or at like... Um, uh, with, uh, Riverside is another one where there's an ARL uh, employee there. So oh, that's we're, we're all over the place. All right, so we're 45 minutes in. We should probably do one of our predictions. So for those of you not familiar with Twitch or are familiar with Twitch, uh, we have we have something called predictions on Twitch, and predictions are typically used for gaming-related questions like, will TJ win this round of the game? But we don't do that on our stream. Uh, instead, we actually do science questions related to the expertise of our guests, and our expert our guest helps come up with questions. And so we ask those questions in the form of predictions. So you guys get some standard internet units, which is the imaginary internet points that we call on our channel our standard internet units. 
Uh, if you're not following, click the follow button. You'll get 300 standard internet units that you can use on things like buying a factoid or making us drink alcohol because we drink throughout the evening. Uh, at least I am tonight. I, I <laughs> TJ's am not, off yeah, for, yeah. for uh, representing the military. It's probably a good idea, but yeah. I'll drink for two tonight if you guys want to spend your internet points accordingly. But we're going to pop up a prediction right now. And so at the top of your chat, you can see that predict button. Click that predict button and you can gamble internet points on. But the question here is, what percent of ARL are military personnel? So Army Research Laboratory has a combination of uh, civilian as well as military personnel. So the question is, what percent are actually military? Like went through full basic training, have actual rankings. Um, what percent of ARL are military personnel? Is it greater than 30% or less than 30%? So you guys have about two minutes to answer that. Um, uh, one thing to note on this, you are on Ask a Scientist Gaming Honor Policy, which means you cannot look up this answer on Google or ChatGPT or whatever it might be. Um, let's, let's keep it honest because you are competing against your colleagues and your cohorts in the chat. So click that predict button and gamble accordingly and click the follow button if you want to waste 300 standard internet units on, on a question. And depending on your degree of confidence, you can bet as much or as little as you want. I don't know if you've done the Twitch predictions at all, but... I, I've not. I've only been a, uh, you know, uh, I think it's term, internet term is a lurker. You know, just, <laughs> yeah. just uh, you know, watching, you know, never really participating. I, I, I appreciate the game theory aspect of, like, <laughs> gambling a certain amount, right? Like, how confident are you? I would love to write a test where that comes into play. <laughs> like the, the more confident you are, the more you can gamble points on it. You would always do something like in an exam where like there's five questions, you rank them. Yeah. Based on how you, how you think you're gonna do. <laughs> you know, but I, I do feel bad for the TA who would have to grade that. Yeah. Would not be an easy grading task. <laughs> no, I agree. Especially the, the subjective questions, it, mm -hmm. yeah, it becomes hard. Hey, do you guys do, uh, so I guess for a question from you about Florida State, do you guys do a lot of like multiple choice? So I'm, what historically, no. Uh, I'm one of the strongest advocates for multiple choice. Actually, I've published in Journal of Chemical Education twice now mm -hmm. on using like modern testing theory and statistical analysis to make exams better and compare in person and online. Mm -hmm. And it turns out in the testing community, multiple choice is the better assessment option, which is okay. kind of counterintuitive. But it really comes down to, and I learned this from a, a friend that I went to undergrad with, actually, but when you think about what testing is, it's a measurement, right? Mm -hmm. And so measurement, you want as many data points as possible, right. as broad as possible. You want to reduce signal to noise. You want to maximize objectivity. And when you take all that into account, it turns out multiple choice is the way to go. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. All right, so TJ, what's the answer? What percent of ARL are military personnel? Yeah, so this actually was something that was surprising to me when I first joined. Uh, it's actually about 1%, so it's less than 30. Wow, it's way less than 30. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we kind of were kidding each other in the grad, like, the, you know, my, my, my research group in grad school, when I got the job, I was like, oh, so we need to ship out for basic training. Um, <laughs> we do not. Uh, so uh, about 60% of the workforce is uh, federal uh, civilian employment. Uh, and then about 39% is contractors, which are you know non-military uh, contractors. And then about 1% is active duty. Um, that's not to say that some of the researchers have military experience, that is very true. We have a few researchers that you know, I see every day who, who have been um, you know through uh, sort of active duty and stuff. And after finishing, they use the GI Bill to go to school and they get PhDs or master's degrees and stuff like that to then move on uh, and become scientists for the life. So non-dairy neutrino, congratulations on your 22 to 1 payout on that, less than 30%. 1% is astounding though, because you think it's more, right? You, you would think it's more, and especially too, like, you know, we're we're scientists trying to solve problems for, you know, the warfighter. Mm -hmm. You would think having more interaction, which is, of course, the goal now and they are trying to ever increase our, our relationship as scientists to, um, you know, active duty uh, military to try to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of opportunities to do that. But it's, what it does mean, too, though, is that you don't necessarily need to have active duty experience to be a researcher for the uh, research labs, which I think is, is helpful to know going in. 
I mean, it, it, it's intriguing that that gap exists because the military for the past, I mean, since World War II, like things like the GI Bill where they try to facilitate college education because there is an education gap and an income gap among military personnel. And so it's, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear they're trying to address that. I was talking to one of my grad students or one of the students I'm on, on her committee. She's she's looking at the, uh, the Navy net, one of the Navy national labs. Mm -hmm. And apparently for whatever position she's going for, she'll have to do basic. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, they go into like uh, special service or? Uh, yeah, I don't know the that. details of oh, it, but yeah. So that's intriguing. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mez has requested take a drink. Cheers, Mez. Thank you for joining us on a Wednesday night for Ask a Scientist Gaming. <laughs> second week of the semester, we can celebrate and relax. It's actually yeah. only our second class because Wednesday and through mm -hmm. uh, Friday last week got canceled because of a hurricane. Mm -hmm. So cheers, Mez. Thank you. And again, congratulations, non-dairy neutrino. You 22 to one payout <laughs> is non-trivial. Take those odds with dark horse betting. Yeah. Speaking of drink tonight, so we're taking it easy tonight. Uh, TJ's not drinking on stream because he's a representative of the military and it's a good choice. Yeah, yeah. But, but tonight I'm drinking Blue Moon. So we're being casual. For those of you that joined us two weeks ago, uh, Nathan Kroc decided we needed some mead, which is like 19 and 18 percent alcohol, honey brewed. That was brutal. Yeah, <laughs> that was, that was, I could feel it on stream as it was happening. All right. What do you want to do? Well, do you want, do you want to switch it up? I can it's, I can leave my you. my home and, and go back to actually my my first major gaming experience which was Halo. Halo. Let's do some Halo. Halo. All right. Yeah. So let's let's leave you with a question so I can yeah. switch around the controllers and everything. So what was your I made it as a scientist moment? Uh, I would say my I made it moment is appearing on the Ask a Scientist Gaming <laughs> right now. No, uh, but seriously, I think, um, you know, these opportunities that I have currently where I'm collaborating with academic professors, um, you know, inter, uh, you know, interacting more with the field, more like I would as a scientist than I would as a grad student uh, is one of those things that's like made it mm -hmm. for me, you know, like being more taken seriously as a scientist, you know, and and stuff like that. I don't know. Just yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, that that's fair. It's yeah. uh, rarely is, is, is it just one moment that you're like, now I made it. It's more of a. <laughs> I, I've woken up and I'm in this circumstance kind of thing. Yeah, like, yeah. Kind of crazy. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, it's it's one of those things that's just very, um, I don't know, it's, just one, it's, it's uh, hard to describe that moment. I don't even know. I, I don't know if I, I've made it yet, even, you know? <laughs> yeah. it's still, it's going to happen yeah. someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, eventually I'll, I'll make it. I guess that's the, uh, not being in like, um, complicity with your research either always pushing forward yeah there's a lot of growth i can still push towards so i don't know yeah you know, no, that's fair yeah that's a, that's a hard question i mean i'm not, not like a tenure track professor i feel like would, would, would you say tenure was your i made it it's or? so anticlimactic because like by your third year you kind of know already right and then there's just a formalism later on and so it's Stick yeah. to the higher ground. You, you, you get that letter. Well, the, the other part about tenure is like you get the vote in the department and then it goes up to the college and then it goes to the provost and then the, you know, the, the president and then, yeah. So it's a journey. So this might be a little too loud for you guys. I'll turn it down a bit. Yeah, we are uh, slightly cheating on the fact of like, I just spilled <laughs> skill set with this game. Um, yeah. We did pre-select my favorite level from the original Halo. This is original Halo, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is, well, technically we're playing on the Master Chief collection. Uh, this is the uh, digitally remastered version of Halo Combat Evolved. So if you press the select button, the left one, you can actually toggle between the original graphics and the remastered graphics. So if anyone hasn't played it, you can play both of them with the Master Chief Collection. Yeah, this is a, a level I enjoy. I'm more of a sniper type uh, style setup, so. Yeah, I, I've played so much of this game in undergrad. Like, we broke into the dorms to actually play Halo 1. Because it was back in the day before Xbox Live where you could only play by the hard network, right? So you had to have an Ethernet connection. But if you plug into the dorms, you could connect to anyone within the dorm network. Which is pretty amazing. So you could do 16 players or whatnot. <laughs> Cuddle Puppy, welcome back. If I take a picture of the periodic table, does that make me a photochemist? Oh, um, you know, technicality is everything there. <laughs> exactly. A photo of chemistry, right? Uh, 
photochemist. I, I like to think that everyone's a photochemist. Everyone enjoys pretty colors, black lights, you know? Everyone loves a good cis trans isomerization, which is oh, how yeah. you guys can see things. So, yeah, <laughs> no, photochemistry all the way. <laughs> But yeah, if you guys have any questions for TJ, zap it down to them. Color chemistry, light chemistry, taking photos of periodic tables, <laughs> updating my resume, skill set, photo chemistry. Yeah, I think that's one of those things like, um, there's something someone asked me once, like, oh, you know, if I, if I, um, you know, memorize the periodic table, am I a chemist? Oop, that's a grenade. Absolutely not. Oh. <laughs> uh, memorizing the periodic table is something I definitely don't do because uh, it's always there. Yep. Now, this is a fight we have, uh, uh, one of the additional ones into the, the testing, and I talk a lot about that, but is uh, what should you actually focus on students learning? And the reality is when you have a cell phone with the entirety of the internet at your access at any point, what skill set do you need? And the answer is not memorizing the periodic table. Uh, A14 wants to know, what's your favorite element? Oh, that's a hard one because, like, you know, grad school, I did ruthenium chemistry, so I would love to say uh, ruthenium because that was like, uh, you know, it got me my PhD, yeah, right? Uh, it's an influential time in your life. It is. Uh, you know, I currently do a lot of iridium photochemistry, so it's uh, iridium's cool. Iridium is pretty sweet. I don't really have, I don't have a favorite. Um, if I had to pick a region of the periodic table, I'm a big fan of. Obviously, it's yeah, you know, the D block transition yeah. levels, you know, you, you know, it just really, um, you can't beat it. They have the electrons to do all the chemistry you need. Yeah. Well, especially the light rooms, right? The platinums, iridiums, ruthenium, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like if, if osmiums of the it. world. Hell yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, now I do forget. How do I but pick up? Good luck with iron and copper and all those first rows that are cheap. Right. <laughs> but it kind of brings it to like the, um, you know, I remember in my bio inorganic class in grad school mm -hmm. being taught about like, you know, the, the time that made it different um, in the world and like why, you know, like iron so useful is that, you know, iron is the most stable with highest proton count. Mm -hmm. um, and then whenever we switched from an anaerobic to aerobic, iron was like readily available and had all the oxidation states required that it could do, you know, be the main active ingredient in uh, like hemoglobin and stuff, for mm -hmm. oxygen storage. So uh, transition metal chemistry, even first row, is very important. Stop. So, Motion tracker Fun factoid, motion although tracker. no one has requested a factoid. I didn't know this. I had uh, Ryan Sturms from um, uh, Drake University actually visited to use our spectroscopy facility, and he studies hemoglobin, oxygen, CO2 binding, and things like that, and carbon monoxide bonding. But he studies plant hemoglobin. <laughs> And I didn't know plants had hemoglobin because it's typically affiliated with bloodstream and oxygen right, transport, right. but yeah. apparently it's used for a lot of stuff. Catalysis and redox chemistry and yeah, fun mm -hmm. factoid. Yeah, it's interesting. I think also like it, what's really interesting is the oxygen transport and other uh, like cyanoproteins that mm -hmm. are copper, copper, yeah, oxygen yeah. storage. Those are so, so cool. Yeah. I think also too, like there's a lot of interesting um, aspects of hemoglobin other than just like how the iron works, but how it changes the conformation of the protein as oxygen binds. There's the four quadrants, and yeah. as you bind, it becomes more and more cooperative. Like, there's so so much cool stuff in, in biology, but it's also so complicated. So I'm so happy to be uh, <laughs> in small the materials, <laughs> yeah, small molecules, materials, chemists, especially like even solid state stuff kind of gets me every now and then. You know, I'm much more a uh... ooh, chemistry really has a fun one. What video game is most chemistry relevant? Oh man, I don't know. Um, that I've played? Uh, probably none of them, which I think is sad. All of them should be very chemistry heavy. <laughs> That'd be, you have to know the periodic table. <laughs> yeah, 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 you must know. I think what's really fun is whenever you're in like those, um, like escape room type mm -hmm. stuff and they always throw in like this like really generic chemistry thing like how to get out yeah i love those no I, i've had that issue before actually when we were at the cermax the southeast regional acs mm -hmm. meeting a couple buddies of mine from grad school actually chris dares and byron farnham we ended up doing a, a escape room that was chemistry themed but we overthought the shit out of that oh, thing. right <laughs> yeah oh it's awful because you're like are you talking molar mass or is this <laughs> you know <laughs> average <Yeah. laughs> And to remember that they're not always the most, um, you know, scientifically minded in those type things. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, chemistry read, read there's, you can look this up on the NSF, but there's a lot of educational related funding for like classroom and things like that. But there's a non-trivial amount of people that are like trying to design like board games or like mm -hmm. video games that are chemistry related. And the fact that you haven't heard of any of them <laughs> means they haven't taken off, but there are goals like, you know, I saw one example where they were trying to do like the Haber-Bosch process and you had to mm -hmm. balance the H2 versus N2 to make ammonia and things like that. And you had to play with temperature and pressure. And so there are people trying to do that, but I don't think it's very mainstream. If anyone can think of a good chemistry, chemistry related video game. See ya, see ya. Man, I love this sniper on this. Yeah, I miss it. This is such a good, like, just real... Yeah, and the pistol was just so oh, high so powered. good, because you could zoom. It had 2x <laughs> zoom. Yeah, and you could feel it every time yeah. you shot. Like, you you felt like there was power behind it. Oh, this just brings me back. I mean, I was really... I was... When did Halo originally came on? I was like... So it's 2001 was the yeah. Halo 1. Do you want to tell you where I was in my education? <laughs> where were you? <laughs> um, I was in middle school. <laughs> I was entering the fifth grade. I was bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. Yeah. Ready to take on the world and, and fight aliens. <laughs> so I, I was a freshman undergrad in 2001, and yeah, this was my life for a good three years, actually. My favorite factoid for this game, though, is you can see at the center of the reticle, the sniper, that little dot in the center. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that existed because for like five years I was playing on this old CRT screen that didn't have the resolution to show that little reticle dot. And then I played the remastered one on an LCD, and I'm like, oh, that would have been helpful. Of, oh, yeah, that, this is the remastered, mm -hmm. to speak of it. That's really funny, though. We had a similar situation. You know, I have a, a young daughter, a young son, and we watch a lot of Disney+, Plus, mm -hmm. uh, specifically Frozen. Frozen is uh, pretty That's good. the best. Um, big thing about Frozen <laughs> 2, though, of course, is that Olaf um, has permafrost. Mm -hmm. And we used to have a TV um, that we bought when we were in grad school me and my wife um and uh it was such bad resolution that you couldn't see the permafrost on olaf <laughs> and so when we got a new one it was like man this is a whole new movie yeah, yeah, yeah. you can just you can see the detail you know so, yeah. so sim similar but you know that's like high def versus 4k so. so so my my like post 10 year gift to myself was actually getting a fairly big oled screen oh like nice I, like i had because i worked for mark thompson right like right, you gotta have um, the old yeah like, yeah so I, I did but it's it's breathtaking how bad some of that old stuff looks like go back and watch star trek the next generation mm. <laughs> it just it doesn't look great on a high resolution screen but so it goes 814 Law asking the important question. What's your favorite Frozen song? Frozen oh. 1 or Frozen 2. Both are acceptable. I don't know. Uh, they're, they're very hard. Um, I think, you know, what blew me away in Frozen 2 was into Lost in the Woods. Mm -hmm. Is the, um, you know, 80s power ballad <laughs> yep. sung by Kristoff <laughs> when... Yeah. Um, you know, his, you know, his fiance, oh, he was asking, he was trying to ask her to marry him, uh, Anna. Um, you know, he was like confused if they were ever going to. I think one of the lines that hit really hard is like, I thought it was a question of when, not a question of whether. It's every time. Um, and then with the singing, oh, yeah. And then with the singing, uh, all the, the, the singing reindeer in it. Yeah, yeah. So dope. It's <laughs> one. Uh, I think when I saw that in theaters, like this is this is the best. So have you heard the Weezer version of that song? No. Yeah. So so Disney has this tendency to take every one of their songs and have a pop singer do it as well, or some sort of popular oh, yeah, singer. Yeah. And so there's a Weezer, Rivers Cuomo, so singing into the wood or. Uh, um, What's the name of the song? Sorry. I'm Lost in the Lost Woods. Lost in the Woods. There we go. Lost in the Woods. Yeah, yeah. You'll have to check it out. <laughs> I'll have to check. That's really good. I love that one. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good song. <laughs> so it's, it's really, I think that's probably the best one because it was, it was so unexpected when I, when I first heard it. That's how I was like, this is a good one. Yeah, they're, they're catchy jams. And, and you don't have, like, there's some psychology behind popular music that if you hear it enough, you have to like it kind of thing. Mm. And as long as your kids are watching that movie, you don't have a choice. You're gonna... Oh, man, I watch so much Frozen. Yeah. Frozen 2. Like, my grad students ask me what my, like, top songs on Spotify are, and they're, like, Frozen. And, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> descendants from Disney and zombies. <laughs> like, yeah, the daughters like them. Oh, yeah, you got to... I mean, it's also, it's good music. I'm a big fan. Oh, man, you get to have Hunters soon on the platform. Oh, you know, this, is, this is the first appearance, right? Is yep. this level? Yep. Yeah. I think, like, the, the craziest thing from this game, I was playing uh, co-op with my cousin. 
on the original Halo. And it's like the last level, you're streaming through like the down ship, the um, is it the Pelican or mm -hmm. whatever it is. And there's the, um, oh, it's the dead. first time you get the plasma cannon. If you remember to pick it up, because there's a grunt who has it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is crazy. And then it became like a staple in the later games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so good. But that's kind of like, it's what the hunters have is like a plasma cannon. So did you, did you play Halo Infinite at all? The newer one? No. So I pretty much stopped at Halo 3. Yeah. I never got anything more than a Xbox 360. Um, you know, grad school kind of took gaming away. Yeah, no, that's yeah. fair. So it's like, not in a bad way. I still play like more like relaxed games, but like sitting down and really playing through like a game of Halo wasn't like my major thing mm -hmm. in grad school. Oh, no. No worries. Respawn point. Yeah, yeah I, I get to do this again. So we can, uh... I was going to say, no complaints. You get to use more sniper bullets. <laughs> yeah, they were back to... Maybe I'll, I'll take a more gentle approach, too, and not... Well, going back to the uh, video game that does chemistry... Um... Chemistry re re Chemistry re <laughs> By the way, my vote is for half one. Oh, so yeah. Half pretty good. Chemistry esque, tangentially related to chemistry. Yeah, I'm a big fan of um, Portal, even though it's not chemistry. It's really. Um... Yeah. Yeah, that was a that was a fun Portal Two was really fun to play with my wife. Actually, yeah, the co-op was amazing. I think I played that with my wife. Mm. I don't think we we got through it. If she's listening, if I don't remember, sorry. I think, I think how got, dare you forget i think we played it she, she's more of a she plays zelda okay um more of like mario party mario kart those kind of games yeah that's kind of like her her speed uh, we played halo cooperative i don't think we did all the way through but we did like halo on normal i mean i think we we're discussing more like my history with halo and i I did legendary for halo 3 with a bunch of friends from high school so that's when you start doing cooperative more than four player, like more than two player, so it was like four player total. Mm -hmm. um, a little more intense than I think what I would do with my wife. We did play a lot of the Lego games, uh, so yeah, like yeah. Harry Potter and th those co op, Lego Harry Potter, Lego um, Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just got my six year old daughter into uh, Lego Star Wars actually. It's just it's such a casual, like, there's no pressure, you just go around and play. Did you ever play? There was a computer game. I think it was like Alpha Squad or Alpha Team. Mm. Uh, it was a Halo-based game where like you basically hit start and the players would move, and then you could place tiles that would tell them to like go left, go right, interact huh. with this thing. It was like a so real-time cool. strategy. Yeah, it was like all puzzles, so mm. it was like really fun. No, I know. I never played that. Yeah, that was like that was like my first. Because there was game. there was Halo Wars, which was the actual like map where you can control the different vehicles and stuff. But yeah. <laughs> nice <laughs> one for good measure. Yeah, you, just, you gotta double tap. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. All right, we're just over an hour in. Uh, Ask Science Gaming mediocre gameplay expert. Science guest today is Dr. T.J. Rorabal. Uh He's um, He's an expert in photochemistry, photophysics, in particularly works at the Army Research Laboratory working on optically limiting materials and uh, molecules that absorb light really well. I guess let's, let's, let's go with that. What does optically limiting materials mean? Yeah, so really, to turn the focus on, I'm just saying RSA, so versatile absorbers, materials that when you increase the um, intensity of light get more opaque. Mm -hmm. um, and there's only uh, a few things because it, it requires a lot of parameters just that the excited state absorbs more than the ground state um yeah other than that it's, it's difficult to find materials that do that so we're constantly making new things and trying to investigate if they work and so can you reveal why the military cares about this no you can't okay no, that's why I, uh, that's the one thing that's that's weird about it right like yeah. academia you try to be a lot more open it's a lot easier talking about making um, you're not, not diminishing it right at all. It's, yeah. like, it's a lot easier to talk about like, oh, you know, we're doing energy conversion in solar cells, which is a very noble task and needs to be done. And it is very important for the military. Greening uh, the military is one of the, um, is one of the objectives 
uh, currently of the Army Research Lab and other Army scientists and military scientists in general. Mm -hmm. um, but it's weird when you're working in different spaces that have applications that you can't talk about. So. Yeah, no, that, that's so in grad school, I worked on near IR light emitting um, diodes and it was mm. particularly for, it was a DARPA project actually. So it was mm. like high risk, high reward, but they wanted things that emit at 850 nanometers on a screen. And like, yeah. it's pretty easy to piece together what that's for, right? And it's cause they wanted near IR goggles and had a near infrared screen that you couldn't see under visible light, right? So mm. you want to have a screen lighting up your face while you're trying to get instructions or something in the field. Mm. And so you can kind of piece it together tangentially, but A14 law has a follow up. Are there any any implications outside the military that you can share? Yeah, so a lot of stuff we make, um, you know, OLED materials are very common. Like that's what they're mainly studied for, like iridium complexes. You'll see that used in TVs and stuff like that. So um, everything we're doing will eventually advance science in lots of different ways. Um, I think one of the bigger things for reading complexes is photo redox chemistry. It was a Nobel Prize a few years ago out of uh, the Macmillan Group at Princeton. Uh, you know, making fine pharmaceutical chemicals. I forgot I was playing for a second. <laughs> no worries. Uh, <laughs> Spawn point. So this is actually one of the hardest parts of this game. Well, they, oh, legendary. This one, is brutal. Yeah, one of them comes out as like invisible, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, mm -hmm. I wasn't paying attention enough. Yeah. Oh, there he is. There, oh, yeah. Yep. Well, there it is. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. I'm gonna just move back over here. I mean, so 814 law, one of the examples of those like saturable absorbers, at least a slow one would be like the, the color changing glasses, right? Mm. Like when you go outside, you get outside in sunlight and UV photons and all of a sudden your sunglasses get darker. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, not a nonlinear optic type material, but a really yeah, man, I mean, man. a useful application of it. Oh, come on, I backed into him. <laughs> oh, jeez, this is gonna be <laughs> sort of the rage this is quick. embarrassing. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna rage quit, I'm gonna beat him. This is the determination, this is I'm gonna make it. I don't care if it's only a 5% yield that's happening. Yeah. All right, I see him. Wait, here he comes, here he comes, here he comes. This way, nope, nope. And just one of the things I like, we have in common on synthetic chemistry. We just want the molecules. We don't care how you uh, We don't care number of steps. <laughs> yeah, no. Making a suitable amount to analyze takes like to do everything for photochemistry, especially because it's like non-destructive, mm -hmm. which is a term you come to love. <laughs> um, you know, as long as you're doing non-destructive techniques, you don't need much. Mm -hmm. Ten milligrams. You know, I don't know how much you guys like shoot for for novel stuff, but like. The bare minimum is like 10. Mm -hmm. And then if you can make, uh, most of the stuff I make, I try to make at least like 100 milligrams off first first go, which I guess to put that in, into scale for non-chemists who don't weigh things constantly, especially as Americans, we don't use crams in our normal day stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh God, I got beat, hit by him again. Um, a paper clip is a gram. So when we're talking about like 100 milligrams, it's a tenth of a paper clip. Man, that's a, that's a really good frame of reference. I haven't heard of that before, but yeah, mm. makes sense. And it is about that. Okay, I got him that time, so I think we're good. I can't remember what difficulty are we playing on? I normal? have no idea, so I'm just kind of going through it. I really hope it's normal. <laughs> I think it defaults to normal. Good, if good. I, had to I mean, guess. my my skill my skill set is not too hot right now, so. <laughs> I mean, actually, I think it defaults to legendary, right? Legendary <laughs> it's game not play. legendary. Obviously. Yeah, no, yeah, obviously. <laughs> Anyone watching the stream or YouTube video, especially you uh, ARL program officers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is clearly legendary. Yeah, the legendary skill set right here. Only the best. Um, uh, no, I think I'm actually like, more playing for my nephews, like not showing I have credit on games, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh. So tangentially related, after mm -hmm. starting at the, the ARL, like working with DOD, talking with program officers, I mean, has your opinion or perspective on the military, military industrial complex, has that changed at all? Hmm. I mean, not, not really. I mean, like an everyday citizen, you know, you're kind of like, um, I think one of the things that is like not known about so much is how much that like, funding through military science brought like real world changes. I mean like the the internet, the the whole ability of us right now to send this Twitch stream out was a DOD funded operation. You know, so there's a lot of breakthroughs that are done through, mm -hmm. you know, different military applications, you know. So I think that was like one of the bigger things I didn't like fully understand. Yeah. Um, you know, going into it and there's like a whole list and I'm 
So sorry to all the public affairs officers who are like, <laughs> talk about this or that. I mean, the internet. The, <laughs> the internet is, is a, it's a right? pretty, it's a pretty good one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. I think too, especially as we go forward into um, more uh, like, greening technologies and stuff and the concern about batteries um like there's a battery group at arl who does um really great work on indestructible batteries there was a nature paper out <laughs> by them on it and one of the things that's like really cool is to see them take a, a, a lithium ion battery that's aqueous base and just cut it with scissors and it still work so only the capacity drops off and not the actual performance which is really Jeez. interesting i mean like there's a lot of th and that's huge for um, you know, civilian applications, especially when we're talking about like EV cars and safer technologies that way, mm -hmm. or like, you know, your phone battery is actually very dangerous. And if you were to pierce it with a knife, it would light on fire. Yeah. And you see those videos occasionally where yeah. something happens and yeah, it ignites. Am I not supposed to go this way? I, I'm so confused. Uh, is this, um, is, is there it, not an entry? Am I wrong? Uh, no. I, I'm in the wrong. I'm sorry, everyone. Yeah, it's I, one of the I, other doorways. Taking you down the wrong path. All right, so speaking yeah, of that, everyone. this yeah. this next question is actually related to this discussion in terms of the impact of uh, DOD research dollars on day-to-day -day life. It might be underappreciated, um, but this is kind of related to that. So yeah, if you guys aren't following us, click the follow button and get your 200 standard internet units. We're gonna put up a prediction right now related to uh, Department of Defense budget. Um, and so the question here, you guys have two minutes. What percent of the 2024 Department of Defense budget goes towards research and development? And it's actually uh, according to the nomenclature is research, development, test, and evaluation. So the question is, of the entire Department of Defense budget that gets allocated every year by the Congress, what percentage of that goes to research-based things or research, development, and testing? A14Law, thank you for the follow. Enjoy your 300 standard internet units. Click that predict button and make your prediction on what percent of the DOD budget goes towards R&D, I guess R&D, T, and E is the... I don't know if they call it that, but I, I, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, I think R and D is just a good like yeah, it's a broad thing on it, yeah. broad blanket statement. But yeah, what percent of the DoD budget goes towards research and development? And to give you some context, the 2024 budget for the military is 842 billion dollars. So what percent of that goes towards R and D, um, whether it's national lab or funding for mm -hmm. academia or private institutions? Right, and I will point out as everyone's doing the predictors, the we, the ARL has a funding arm to academia and small businesses mm. uh, to solve pro, uh, you know, Army pro, uh, problems. It's uh, Army Research Labs. Mm. You can find, I think one of the links is to um, ARO's website with the broad agency announcement, which gives you topics of interest uh, to those program managers. So if you're an academic out there, um, you know, trying to find funding or a small business uh, interested in working on these types of problems, you will find different funding avenues uh, that way. I am an academic. <laughs> yeah, and you, you've gotten ARO funding in yeah, the past, right? Yeah, yeah. So you, you have more experience than I do. ARO grants. Yeah, what's interesting about that, whenever we submit an ARO grant, we have to say, like, here's the Department of Defense relevance. So you have mm -hmm. to go through the call and, like, what, what are their priorities? What is this going to mm -hmm. solve? Or what could it enable that might solve a problem eventually? So... Gavin, I love video games. We all love video games, which is why we're on Ask a Scientist Gaming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Full-grown adults drinking, playing video games, and talking science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's funny because, like, we're in this. You know, yeah, you know, my generation of scientists grew up playing games like this. It's, yeah, it's interesting. It's just it's very ubiquitous in our lives now. Yeah, it's uh, th this this stream or this outreach strategy. I think it speaks to anyone like forty years and younger. So I'm I'm forty one right now. So I'm the oldest of the millennials. <laughs> so anyone that grew up after me had the Nintendo their entire life, right? right. And that existed. But someone older than me, this is a it's a hard sell in terms of. Um, Gavin, brave of you to admit such things on Twitch, <laughs> a video gaming platform. <laughs> All right, so. TJ, what percent of the 2024 DOD budget is for R&D? So I think if you use the um, you know current, because it's technically not um, 
fully approved yet, but for next year, you're looking at about 17%. So greater than 10% like, yeah. of that uh, 842 billion goes towards, and the list is research, development, test, and evaluation. So that's $145 billion goes towards research-related things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's spread over the whole Department of Defense. So you have a lot of different research labs, centers, uh, things like that. So it's not always, um, it's not like all that's going to our lab, you know, all over dispersed into academics and small businesses and stuff. Could you imagine that 142 billion? Oh, I, I looked up the, the Manhattan Project and translating those numbers to modern day, and it's something like a trillion dollars went towards the Manhattan Project. That's great. Just building it off the ground and, and you know, generating isotopes. And mm. You imagine that, throwing that much money at any problem right now. Like how, how long would it take you to solve something? But that's crazy. And, and so I, I guess let's talk about this framework a little bit. And you're going to talk about this presumably in your seminar on Friday. But there's, yeah, I will be talking about that. There's, yeah. there's a lot of national labs, right? There's like yeah. NREL National Renewable Energy Lab. There's Argon. There's Los Alamos, mm -hmm. which does nuclear stuff. And then there's military. Like there's different subsets of national labs. Yeah. And like how, how does that break down? What are the, the different branches? And, so there, there's a lot. I mean, it falls under a lot of different things. So if you were mentioning there, they fall under like Department of Energy. So you're looking at Argon, Los Alamos. Those labs are all um, Department of Energy, like NIST, FDA, um, or USDA. Mm -hmm. Those labs, I, I, I might be wrong on this. I think they fall under just like Commerce. Mm. I want to say so. Like uh, yeah, I might be wrong on this, and I, I I apologize if I'm not fully correct. Non dairy but mentioned PNNL. PNNL, which is also a DOE um, lab, and then and, and DOD labs. I mean, there's a bunch of different centers. It'd be too much to like really even talk about because like even in the army we have so many different labs and centers. Like it's it's a lot, but um, you know like each. You know, a major branch has a research lab. So there's an Army, Navy, and Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, just name a few. But Is then, there a Space Force lab yet? So I know the, the correct terminology on this. So Air Force la Research Labs is the lab for both. So it's oh, one it lab. Oh, so it falls under. <laughs> it's one lab, two services, as I like to say. So, <laughs> All right, good to know. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Space Force I, is also a service. <laughs> I, I did not know that. That's intriguing. Yeah, yeah. All right, and so their primary funding sources is through those main branches of government funding then. Like DOE pays for a good portion of the energy-related labs then. Yeah, uh, sorry. Like, that's where I'm supposed to go? I think it's up. Is it not? Do I do I hit up? Is it up no. there? I'm so confused because I was just here. I don't know. Is there a controller? Can you push X next to that? Does that turn it? Yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, X next to it. I must have just reloaded go. last time. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Mm. Spacing out here. Oh, and then it's over here. Okay, I think they just gave up on me. And <laughs> it's like, you're not going to hit X, so go over here by yourself. Um... Sorry, where were we on the? Uh, we're talking Sorry. about funding for those national labs. So, so some portion of this 145 billion goes towards maintaining and then. Yeah, I mean, like labs. the actual intricacy of it is like so far outside of like what my real knowledge is, and I wish I had much more knowledge on this. But yeah, um, yeah it's a lot of there's a lot of facilities cost, and then just, I mean, the workforce itself too is expensive. So like, there's a lot of that goes into that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's something I didn't appreciate, like what percent of military, and, and you talked about this earlier, like things that translate like the internet, which is really uh, initially a military endeavor and then mm. changed all our lives. And I'm, I'm sure like everything from battery technology to lighting to solar cells, I mean, mm. foundations in DOD funded research, which is crazy. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think like one of the big examples that like really gets tossed around a lot and of course, from like a, a time period that's like not seen as like one of the most like, you know, altruistic and all that is, you know, you look back at, you know, Germany um, pre-World War One, and of course, you know, Haber is one of these guys <laughs> who, yeah, Fritz Haber, um, he's toted as someone who killed millions and saved billions, yep. you know, because the Haber-Bosch process made ammonia readily available and they can make it on liters and liters and liters of scales in a day mm -hmm. of course then that gets made into fertilizer which of course caused the green revolution which allowed the you know quote unquote carrying capacity of the earth to increase um but of course you're always um you know thinking about well it was also used to make explosives and bombs yeah. and, and all that but i, I yeah 
Of course, there's that research, but not always been. Yeah. Well, Fritz Haber, the other thing, I mean, he's the yeah. father of modern chemical warfare, right? Like, yeah. he came up with precursors to phosgene and, like, mm -hmm. chlorine gas. And, yeah. Like, he was kind of an all-around scumbag, but also, if on average, half the nitrogen in your body came from the Haber-Bosch process, which is insane. That's like, crazy to think about. It? Yeah. Like, yeah. So I think there's always that, but that's, that's true with any, like, research that's being done. I feel like there's always going to be... Other fun factoid is Fritz Haber is my great 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 academic grandfather. Oh really? Yeah, I'm lineage from oh, Fritz wow. Haber. Thank yeah. you. So I'm the great 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 grandson of modern chemical war. Oh geez, <laughs> no pressure. I think you know you can follow that academic tree far enough. Everyone ends up with like Bunsen. And... Have you seen the the website the the chemistry? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, I think I mine goes it. back to, to to Bunsen. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think it. it, it Her, helps that... is on mine. Like yeah. I don't know what he did but i know he's got a flask yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay i'm like locked in this area all right non-dairy i'll get back to your question but i'm going to catch up 814 law wants to know what's your favorite topic outside of chemistry and why this could be hobby this could be like uh, my favorite topic. Intellectual so. endeavor. Uh, not much intellectual endeavors uh, as the time. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I really like my favorite hobby is, is I, I like doing a lot of woodworking. That's fun. I like it's it's I mean, I can't like take it away from like being a synthetic chemist, but I, I really like making things, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so like I kind of see, you know, synthetic chemistry similarly. So it's like the same kind of thing, just different scales. Um, so I, I really enjoy doing woodworking and learning different ways to, to make things. I mean, it's similar, like, you know, you want a new coupling reaction. Mm. It's like making a new joint, you know, different ways to put things together. Yeah. I don't know if that really answers the question. So, so do you have, like, a woodworking shop? You have, like, the tool collection that you're building? I have a very modest uh, tool collection, mainly built of, like, a couple of things I bought from Home Depot and my dad's old tools. Uh, <laughs> So I have a very modest wood shop in my basement. Yeah. That was kind of a, we, we put that into the plan when we were buying a house to make sure there was enough space for a wood shop. Oh, that's awesome. We lucked out. There was definitely enough space. You made anything useful? Uh, I built the, so this is before I even had our house um, that we're currently living in. Uh, I made the bed frame, the oh, wow. like bed frames, uh, uh, matching end tables, uh, you know, in, in our uh so how much how much like that. of that is is YouTube related internet searching how to do stuff? You know, YouTube is a very useful source for these things. I, yeah. I think that's like one. I built up a lot of confidence in like um, I'm trying to find like a new gun because this one's out and I don't want to use my sniper. I'm just gonna kind of walk around. Yeah. Um, uh, so YouTube helps a lot. A lot of it, like I, I took a lot of tech and in high school mm. so like woodshop classes and stuff so like knowledge from there and also just like randomly calling my dad and be like hey i'm trying to do this thing like what do you think that's awesome. or showing them yeah so it's things like that but youtube's helpful youtube um definitely read it a little bit you know a lot of uh useful information for sure man i love so so i'm a casual reddit user uh, but i use it a lot but sometimes you come across like these very specialized subreddits like there's a woodworking subreddit obviously oh, yeah. and people that construct things with like no nails or glue right it's just like mechanical joints like oh, that's man. crazy like old school japanese carpentry is oh, yeah, like the yeah, most yeah. insane thing it's so satisfying oh, i'm pretty sure like our oddly satisfying has like that constantly on there because mm -hmm. just watching like these two pieces of wood just like <laughs> intricate designs slide together and yeah, be yeah. perfectly mounted that's so satisfying it's, it's, yeah, yeah even if you don't care about woodworking there's something about that just like fitting <laughs> yeah just yeah gorgeous it's, it's oddly satisfying yeah nonsense an app descriptor yeah all right i'm gonna take this non-dairy neutrino wants to know there's always a comparison between academia and industry especially when it comes to compensation but where does the uh, national lab fall not looking for specifics just curious about the relative we actually have a prediction related oh, yeah, to that's, this that's a good one yeah maybe we should bring that up and then we can discuss further yeah 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 we can do the different tiers associated with it you guys are taking us right where we want to go which is kind of fun oh no there's a lot more 
All right, so we're popping up the prediction right now. If you're not following, click the follow, get your 300 standard internet units that you can request a factoid, you can make us drink alcohol, whatever it might be. But first, you got to earn those standard internet units by either following, but also bet those points on this prediction, which is, the question is, what's the postdoc salary at the Army Research Laboratory? Hmm. Is it greater than 80,000 or is it less than 80,000? Um, and so to give context to this number in academia, I think the base salary is something for a postdoc is something like 45,000. And it's like the NIH bare minimum salary kind of thing. So uh, the question is, if you're starting as a postdoc at the Army Research Laboratory, what is your salary greater than 80K or less than 80K? And I have to imagine this is specific depending on the national lab you're at, right? Yeah, it's also okay. gonna be locale based. Okay. So if we're talking about working in a, you know, an um, a national lab that's in DC, which is one of the higher pay localities, that's probably gonna be more equipped. Yeah. Um, but let's just say for uh, working at Army Research Labs currently, not because I have two postdocs open or anything. <laughs> if anyone's looking for a postdoc, if anyone's looking for two send, postdocs, send TJ an email. Hit me up. Contact information is probably somewhere. <laughs> yeah, you, actually, we have a link to the job opening. Oh, yeah, the, the, yeah. The there Twitch, are, you added that. Yeah, I did. Okay, yeah. So if you go to AEOP, which is Army Outreach and um, Education Program, we have two postdoc uh, positions opened up. Um, one for spectroscopy of nonlinear optic materials and one for the synthesis of them. Oh, Cuddle Puppy, we'll get back to your question in a little bit. Uh, cuddle, cuddle Puppies are a professional troll. <laughs> oh, <that was laughs> Always can be relied on to take us in interesting directions. And I'm interested how you answer this question. But you guys have about 10 seconds left. Gamble accordingly. Uh, postdoc salary at ARL is it greater than 80000 or less than 80000 uh, This is uh, the Washington, D.C.-based salary. So yes. put your prediction in there right now. All right, it's closed. So, TJ, what's the answer? So it's actually going to be greater... Um, so if you were going to start a uh, postdoc currently under the AOP, um, oh Jesus, like difficult, um, <laughs> under the uh, AOP fellowship right now, it starts at 94K. 94K. And uh, so, yeah, so the idea is that to recruit the best, you got to pay a little more, mm -hmm. um, especially then locality based. Um, you know, the DC, there's only one other region that is greater, and that's San Francisco. Um, oh, no. How slow you move. You know, I wish it was like a sprint button. Yeah, yeah. There's um, no sprint or clamber or anything in this no. one. It's just uh, brute force. Yeah, so um yeah, it's like it's it one of the things is like it's all about, you know, recruiting the best people to get the problem solved. Um I think one of the things that's like different in government versus academia, it's about paying um people um you know high enough that you're recruiting the best because Salary becomes the expensive part versus like grad students really cheap. So their time is cheap, um, but in government their salary is higher because they're expected to you know produce, you know at that level. Does that make sense? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> puppy, ninety four k in DC lets you rent a cardboard box with only fifty holes in it. Yeah, it it, it is. <laughs> I think it's expensive. <laughs> it is expensive, um, but it is adequate. As a, a postdoc, I was able to. Um, you know, support myself and my, and my my wife and you know our first kid mm -hmm. um, for a while, and that's how it was lower back then. But that was yeah, five years ago. I mean, that's uh, again compared to academia. It, it depends where you are, obviously. But mm -hmm. I mean, forty five thousand for a postdoc is not off the wall in academic institutions, and even starting salary for assistant professor is probably what eighty to ninety thousand right now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the ninety four k for a postdoc is pretty solid. It's pretty good, yeah, and that's a, a stipend, not a um, a salary, so it's a little different, mm. but um, it's definitely good. Non-dairy neutrinos. Are y'all looking for post-masters in computational science? <laughs> Is that going to fulfill your there, Well, I mean, you never know what's open, so I'd highly recommend, um, you know, looking, uh, like, so the workforce is about, like, 40% PhD, I believe. Um, so it's not all PhD, so masters and bachelors uh, definitely are in the workforce. So, um, you know, don't think you need a PhD to necessarily what, work. What was the lab. website you mentioned searching for these jobs? Uh, so the, the best one for Army right now is it's AEOP, so Army Outreach and AE, Army Education and Outreach Program, um, fellowships and apprenticeships. Um, they also run a lot of the, um, for graduates and undergrads, actually they have uh, internship opportunities all the way from high school to graduate level. 
So um, there will be postings there for that as well. So this is the... That is it, yeah, okay. yeah. And if you look under... Um, if you follow along through, like, um, yeah, students and apprentices and fellowships, that's going to get you the the place right there, yeah. Okay, this is the more specific link if you guys are interested. Yeah. Checking out opportunities, and these aren't... That there are like short-term opportunities, presumably, and long-term. I mean, are there? Uh, so the postdoctoral fellowships, especially like the ones we're we're looking for, they're about like a two to three year position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's all up at uh, um, up to renewal every year, mm -hmm. uh, just depending on like mutual how it's going and if you're finding it useful. Right, no sense to force you to stay longer if you're not in enjoying it or finding mm -hmm. it rewarding. Um, but then, you know, like one of the things, best ways to get into some of these labs is these entry ways. Um, so doing fellowships, internships, postdoctoral fellowships and stuff. That's like one of your best ways for um, obtaining a long-term job. Because those are also time-based. There's positions available if funding is right, you know. I mean, so that was your um, journey. You did a postdoc in the direct later research scientist. Yeah, status. so I did a uh, postdoctoral fellowship. It was under a different program that they don't use much anymore. Mm. Um, but... Uh, so I did a postdoc for a couple years, um, became a federal employee, and then I've been there ever since. So, yeah. So guys, check out yeah. those links if you're interested. And find mm -hmm. some opportunities, some fellowships, what it might be. All right, Cuddle Pip Puppy, bringing us back to the uh, important questions. Speaking of discussions you want to have, if you had to kiss a fish on the mouth, what species would you pick? Oh man. <laughs> What's the classic internet question? It's like, would you rather fight one horse-sized oh, duck or one hundred duck sized horses or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> Cuddle puppies trying to, <laughs> trying to bring one out. <laughs> oh, man, I just can't say no. I can't just be like, nah, not, not my thing. Um, <laughs> Your army ref will be watching and yeah, <laughs> judge you accordingly. This <laughs> thing, uh, I don't, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know much about fish. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. I'm gonna go with the uh, the oh. like classic fish store beta fish. They oh, look classy. Yeah, well, like they're very elegant. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, are you also fish size, or are you still human size while catching the fish? <laughs> That's a good question. These are these are these are questions <laughs> yeah, I need. We to need know. to limit our parameter space to answer yeah, we gotta, accurately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cuddle puppy, you asked a poor question. <laughs> I revise accordingly. Oh <laughs> uh, man, that's pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, so, so so being so close to to Washington D.C., I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of really cool stuff there, like the museums and just mm -hmm. like things to see. Like, how much do you go out for fun? Oh yeah, I mean, so we just went to the um, we did a day at the National Zoo, so mm -hmm. the Smithsonian Zoo that's in. Uh, um, I forget the exact location in DC, but it's like north, uh, west DC. Um, and then we're really close to Baltimore, so um, not long ago we went to the Baltimore Aquarium. That's awesome. And so we were able to do a lot of fun stuff like that. There's all the museums. So um, I guess another part of it too is that like uh, even being in a you know being a research uh, scientist for the government, I still mentor students a lot. Mm. Um, so like I'll have, uh, you know, I'll have a visiting grad student from your group, uh, this upcoming summer, but every year I, um, will mentor, uh, ROTC students, mm. um, in different undergrad, uh, programs as well. And one of the things that's nice is like, they're from all over. And so every week I was like, Oh, so what'd you guys do? And they're like, Oh, we went to this museum or we yeah. went here. So there's so much to do in the area. Um, you know, I got young kids, so I don't always take large advantage of um all the places but you know when i first moved i did all the very touristy things most of the smithsonian's well, i mean they're not old enough to appreciate most of that yet but, yeah i'm not like, gonna hit an edge age where that's awesome right? yeah and the aerospace museum is like really cool but not really to like you know infants <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you know so i think uh yeah all right, we got some follow-ups on our important topic earlier. Um, Meg L M M M, can we get an opinion on one billion lions versus one of each Pokemon? <laughs> wait, wait, so is it, one wait. billion lions versus uh, 
all of a Pokemon. Uh, so is it lion sized lions or Pokemon sized lions? It's uh, standard sized lions, standard sized Pokemon, according to Pokemon lore. This I mean, is actually a, is this that a standard question? No. So this is oh, yeah. uh, actually a student from my class. Meg, welcome to the stream. Thank you for joining us. So on on syllabus on the first day of class, uh, MSU man, well, the state of Florida mandates a an attendance policy where if somebody doesn't attend the first day, they get booted out of the class. Uh, and this is why parking is so crazy. bad on the first day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so the way I do that survey in, in my class of 350 students is I'll have a question on Canvas, which is our online website for yeah. tests and quizzing and whatnot. And I'll have a question, you know, a generic one, and then I'll have a follow-up question, which is who would win one billion lions or <laughs> all Pokemon? And so oh, students oh. took that very seriously. Wait. A billion lions? A billion lions. You gotta, you're going to wear down the Pokemon. I mean, there's only so much, you know. And they obviously don't respect turn base when they're lying. <laughs> That's true. So, you like, take that into account. You got to take that. You gotta... Pokemon need their, their rest time between moves. <laughs> yeah, so I think... Uh, Cuddle Puppy isn't uh, Mewtwo capable of destroying planets. Yes, like some po Pokemon uh, yeah. are literal gods, so... Yeah, yeah, I guess if you're you're throwing Mewtwo in there. Yeah, so the thing I mentioned during class, because I today was our first day back, and I, I go through some of their answers, because I have one you can vote on who would win, and then another one you can give a rationale behind it. Mm. And so there's some fun, like a billion's a lot of lines and whatnot. But one of the things I'd like to do in Gen Chem 1 is you can calculate the amount of CO2 generated by vaporizing a billion lions. And it, oh, would essentially, it would eliminate all oxygen from our atmosphere, right? Yeah. Everyone uh, would suffocate just from that alone. But... I guess that doesn't uh, affect uh, <laughs> Pokemon. Yeah. Well, I mean, do uh, then they have like space travel in one of them, one of the movies, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of them can go into space. Yeah. No, I, th I think they'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, I think I think. So I give it to. It's just a, a sure amount. Because you think about it, right? You say oh, 150 Pokemon, right? Versus a billion lions. So Pokemon, somebody did the number, the math on it. So it's it, there's according to canon, there's one thousand and twenty Pokemon, which okay. ends up being nine hundred eighty thousand three hundred fifty three lions per Pokemon. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a lot. A lot. I mean, uh, so friendly. Um, yeah, that's too many. I, I think I think I think lions get it if you have a billion. <laughs> <laughs> the cuddle puppy also a, a meta critique of, of Pokemon in general. Imagine being a god and getting trapped by a ten-year-old who throws a metal ping pong ball at you, <laughs> which is which is true. As long as the lions don't have metal ping pong balls, those they'd be fine. All right, cuddle puppy. Following up on the uh, the horse-sized duck question is super easy though, because the duck's bones wouldn't be able to support its weight as it increases in size. I don't know. Do you do you expect their um, you know their density to also increase? Like it's. So that, but that's a really fun. That's... And I've had this discussion before. Why super large bugs don't exist? And there's a surface area to volume ratio that becomes an issue. And the same thing's true with hollow bones. Yeah. And so it, it's like you can't grow too big, and that's why you can't have giant cockroaches because they're. The way they breathe is not circulatory system based; it's it's diffusion based, so it's surface area limited. Yeah. So their sizes. Huh. Yeah. No, that's a that's that's a really fun question, though, Cuddle Puppy. Thank you for taking us down that journey. <laughs> Ask a scientist gaming where we explore all the possibilities. So, yeah. Meg, thank you for the question. Glad you could join us. I hope you uh, you enjoyed the answer. A billion lines is a lot. <laughs> so, just I don't know the sure amount. Oh, non-dairy neutrino reminds me of how mountains have a maximum height per planet. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I haven't seen that analysis before, but that makes sense. Yeah, they're just fundamental limits. All right, non-dairy neutrino and a science question: How deep does your average photochemist deal with things on the level of quantum electrodynamics, is, or is it more of light has energy and now molecule has this energy, assuming the appropriate frequency for absorption? Ooh. Ah, that's a hard question. So, what was the first part of that? How much do you deal with? Uh, how much do you deal with on the level of quantum electrodynamics, or we'll just say quantum mechanics in general? Quantum mechanics. I mean, so a lot of stuff where, like, does that wave function exist to get you to that excited state, right? That's important. Um, so, like, does it absorb that photon of light, and then what does it do with it? Like, very basically, yeah, that's what I do on a day to day, right? 
the he's trying fun, to, to tune it, but yeah, sorry. The other fun part of that is, is it's polarization dependent, right? Like yeah. you're an oscillating cloud and molecules have a particular shape. And so it does matter a lot, especially in the solid state, which, yeah, we do a bunch of anisotropy. Solution, it doesn't matter as much. But the other one that's relevant for us, and sorry, I know a bunch about TJ's research just because yeah. we're related areas, but yeah. uh, singlet versus triplet states, whether mo whether electrons are aligned, you know, anti-parallel, which is a singlet, mm -hmm. or they're aligned parallel, essentially, which gives you a triplet state. That matters a lot in the stuff that we work with. And that's, that's a very quantum mechanical yeah. phenomena that you have to be aware of. Yeah. No, I mean, day to day, am I trying to solve these <laughs> no. uh, type of things? No, never. I mean, I'm, I'm making the material, seeing where they absorb, where they emit, mm -hmm. you know, doing the more rudimentary, I guess, in the sense, but also like, I mean, I do a lot of synthetic tuning. So trying to figure out like, well, if I put this functional group here, how does it affect the excited state? Stuff like that, which is more like applied, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I never took quantum in grad school. Did thermo and kinetics in grad school, but not quantum. Yeah, non dairy neutrino. I had a lot of fun in my computational quantum chemistry class where we only touched on this stuff. And I mean, for most chemists, they only have to touch on it. Like it's much mm. more of a, you know, applied level. And even people that understand it on a really fundamental level don't necessarily use it for application. So mm. I think there's a really important balance to strike there. Yeah, that's fun. So what's your favorite question so far? Is it kissing, kissing a fish? Or? I think, you know, kissing a fish, is the, you know, the one I didn't answer. Yeah, kissing a fish, that's great. Yeah. You're, you're going to end up a case study on, like, PR for the Department of Defense. Yeah, catch me uh, losing my job. I no, guess, like, well, obviously, it's this fish. I don't even know. I, you know, I've not been trained in the military stance on how we yeah. kiss fish. I'm sure the Navy has some. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we have my Navy cohort. And that's not... Army doesn't care. Kiss all the fish you want. Yeah, it's, it's just, your spare time. I just don't know like what you would like try to go for. Like, is slimy a problem? But like, catfish is out there, right? <laughs> I mean, but catfish has a, a, a mustache. Kind yeah. Of, you know. Well, also, catfish like, has a negative dating connotation. So yeah, right. You want to be tied uh, into that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> These are the we're the, the hard hitting questions for yeah. right now. Well, also go, going along that lines, like what's what's your worst case in terms of a like reprimand for like public communication? Like what's what you'd say Ugh. something, reveal a state secret, and then like what would that look like? Oh man, um, I hope I never find out. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, um, did they give you a like primer and a coaching on this and what would yeah. happen? No, I mean we're all trained in uh, operational security and stuff like that, so we're allowed to talk about um, and how you deal with. Um, Stuff like that, but yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if I really like what really to discuss that. Kind yeah, of I mean, know? at yeah. some point it gets so extreme that it's like you know treasonous and it's jail time and stuff. But yeah, well, I mean, you you don't want to be someone that ends up in a like pro security prison for giving secrets, you know? I don't know. That's fair. All right, non dairy neutrino has a follow up. Uh, speaking of computational stuff, do you use yeah. much computations in your work? Gaussian question mark, or is it more on the bench top? Uh, absolutely. Computational chemistry is used to guide the type of materials we um, make in a sense of like understanding where electron density is going in the excited state can tell us a lot about different synthetic targets we should go towards um, while we're tuning excited state properties we're interested in. Uh, so TDFT is where standard, just trying to model um, what the ground state structure is and its absorption properties um, as well as trying to predict like triplet you know especially we're working in the um you know we're working in the um you know complexes that have triplet manifolds that are easily accessible inter by inter-system crossing so modeling those are important so yeah it's used a lot i don't do it we have collaborators um that do that for us what did they do software package wise uh they're using gaussian um mm -hmm. and doing yeah tdft is it standard and like what you would do with most transition metal complexes yeah it's outside like, of like the very specifics uh, yeah it's like b3 lyp lazy yeah so not even yeah. oh so we that's the big thing too is like you know using there are probably it, multiple isn't there yeah there's an invisible there guy. is definitely an invisible guy yep. right yep yeah, yeah, yeah where are you uh, non dairy neutrino. I'm familiar with DFT, which is density functional theory, but mm -hmm. what is the first T? It's TDD. Yeah, it's time dependent density functional theory. Yeah. 
So if you want to find something dynamic like light absorption, which is a time resolved event, it's mm. time dependent and still function to theory, which is hard to do, I guess, to do accurately at least. That's yeah. What's well, really difficult, especially with um, wait, where is isn't he here? No, I'm invisible. Or he might come in after you release them. Yeah, maybe that's I, mean, I released them. Do I have to come talk? Nope, he's down. Um, might be when you exit this room. Yeah, maybe. I knew that it's supposed to be around here somewhere. Yeah, I remember this distinctly, like suffering through this on Legendary. Yeah. Because yeah. you're trapped. Like, there's no way out in this room. Yeah, I think you have to find, like, the one. No, nope. okay, no one's here. So I guess I leave. Um, yeah, but the uh, TDT is just a way to figure out where, like, I mean, the way we use it mainly is just where is electron density going when you shine light on a material? So trying to model the HOMO, which is where electrons are, so the highest occupied molecular orbital, mm -hmm. and then the LUMO, which is where they're going, which is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So that's that's the usefulness of it, which, you know, if you're able to go to my talk tomorrow, you'll see. <laughs> yeah. If you want to swing by uh, yeah. CSL 1003 <laughs> at 4 yeah, o'clock tomorrow I'll, Eastern. Talking all about it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's fun. Yeah. yeah, I just sent uh, Joe Schlenoff info for announcing your seminar. So. Oh, okay. Oh, well. It's becoming more real by the day. <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> Ecstatica will be there. So we have at least uh, one yeah. person that's going to show up. A student from FSU is, is here. So. Oh, perfect. Oh, man. Ecstatica, you could be a planted question. What do you want them to ask you? Oh. oh you could you could make yourself look brilliant right now. Yeah, there's a lot of softballs. But <laughs> just, oh, I, I don't even know. Ecstatica, you should just raise your hand and ask if you had to kiss a fish. Oh yeah, right. That, that's perfect, right there. Just yeah. During just, the seminar. Uh, yeah. And we'll just sit in silence for five minutes, like we did tonight. Just mm, I don't know. Okay, so I'm definitely lost. It's definitely this room. I released the prisoners. I don't say that. I would do it. I have no shame. Yeah. Huggy Beer, welcome back to the stream. Huggy Beer has requested a factoid. So a factoid, a knowledge bomb. Do you have a knowledge bomb you want to drop on the audience? Oh, geez, I had them, and I just... Um, no, do I have any locked? So it might be a different room than this one. Unless you can open that? No. I, I did it. I released them. And oh, then... yeah. Find another one of these. I think there's another prison bay that has Captain Keys in it. Yeah, yeah that's what go. you need no, is there. keys. Yeah. yeah. So find it. Find another one of these rooms. Sorry, yeah. I interrupted. No, no. Huggy this is very important or I'd be walking around Factoid. aimlessly. What's your knowledge bomb while you're finding Captain Keys? Jeez. Oh, man. This is like... I'm going to tell you, this is like um, the aging that you uh, don't want to learn about as you're young is like your mind just can't focus on like five <laughs> things at once i mean yeah to be fair you have like blaring lights in your face playing games while talking yeah and i'm trying to find the room with captain keys you know they usually give you like a little logo where to go yeah ecstatica i used to be a really hardcore halo player like halo one like i do mm -hmm. term tournaments and stuff like we had a team oh wow you really regularly. yeah like we were really into it for several years and then it faded on halo 2 and halo 3. so, so is that not the room this... No, there should be one of them. Now, Dairy, oh, do you yeah. know which one he needs to go through? There's probably more than one opening. No, that's uh, yeah. So this is this is multiple openings this way. But yeah, I also bought the uh, Xbox One to play Halo Infinite, but it just the open world um, campaign mode. It was just so slow and monotonous and mm -hmm. hard to do stuff. I was just very frustrated. Now I'm upstairs. See, I already went through this area. Yeah, I think you're going back to the... Well... No, there's more people, so maybe I'm going the right way. Yeah, yeah. classic rules. If there's something to kill, you're in the right direction. Yeah, you're moving, moving forward. Okay, maybe that's the problem. Uh, Nandari said, I know the room you were just left, you just left, is where you find uh, flood keys. Yeah, no, that's true. Flood, he shows up in the flood form in that room. Spoilers, audience, I apologize. Yeah, spoilers from <laughs> 20 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> More than 20 years ago. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I mean, I remember playing this game, and you're like, oh, we're fighting aliens, and you're fighting a massive oh. plague alien. Like, it's crazy. Man, so you, so you were all probably a little too young to appreciate, but how, how groundbreaking this was as a first-person shooter. Like, oh. before this was, like, GoldenEye, which GoldenEye is great gameplay and stuff, but it looks like shit, and it didn't have the two-joystick controller. This changed everything. Yeah, I mean, I remember, because, uh, I mean, I was again, it was middle school age for me um i remember playing it as a kid and re really enjoying it 
But yeah, no, not not appreciating it. I played um, Goldeneye, mm -hmm. uh, but the the one friend I played it with, he really liked playing slaps only. <laughs> Slappers only. Slappers, and then, <laughs> yeah. um, but you know the trick with that is to play odd job. Odd job. Yeah, because yeah. you have to look down the slap odd job. <laughs> So you kind of get away uh, from that. Yeah, I'm aging myself by knowing all that information, but yeah, no, yeah. it's classic. <laughs> Odd job was basically cheating, which is pretty amazing. Oh, all man, right. I'm just like walking around in circles. Sorry, we, so we completely interrupted. We still have not uh, delivered on Huggy Beer's factoid. Factoid. He requested, uh, he requested a factoid. Um, ooh, well, maybe we can steal one of these. So. Is it okay if I steal one of these just for a quick? Yep. Just don't think. Yep, yeah, we'll sacrifice it. We'll sacrifice it. Is that okay? All right. Yep. Um, so as, as a photochemist, it's something we actually kind of discussed this morning, just like a quick one that's interesting, um, that if you sign, uh, if you were to shine a one, um, yeah, a one milliwatt laser for one second, so like a laser pointer, which are tend, tend to be less than five milliwatt. Yep. Um, it would be three uh, times ten to the is that fifteen? Fifteen yep. photons, which is just insane to think about how many photons there are in one second of a laser pointer. Yeah, that's yeah. like not even a burning laser pointer. That's just yeah, a, that's like just... standard Logitech. I think they're they have to be less than one milliwatt, right? Or they have to be class. They have to be two or something. They have to be less than five, which okay. makes them class one, I believe. Mm. And hopefully, laser safety is not watching the stream. <laughs> but, uh, but like, you guys have to appreciate that is a shitload of photons. It's a lot. And it's if you lot. can translate that to electrons, all of a sudden you're generating a lot of photo current, and that's what solar cells do. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go back to that room. I think it's this way. So Huggy Beer, um, the answer is three times 10 to the 15th photons for a one millisecond yeah. laser for one second, um, or one milliwatt laser for one second. Uh, to give you context, the solar, so milliwatt is essentially energy per second, it's joules per second. Uh, one milliwatt is like a standard laser pointer. The solar spectrum across the entire sun is somewhere around 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared per area so yeah that's a lot of photons that's why your car heats up when you leave it out in the sun mm. um 814 law wants to know what are some of the challenges of doing photochemistry I think so we, we, talk, I, we talked about this earlier it's focusing on the periodic table while you take the photo yeah table. yeah that's a big thing is <laughs> make sure you get the right aperture <laughs> You know, so everything is focal clear. length. Like, yeah, this yeah. Stuff matters. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one of the hardest things. So in grad school, I made photoreactive materials, and so there were uh, materials that I had to work in the complete dark. Oh yeah, that's while handling, terrible, isn't it? running a column in the dark. Yeah, I ran columns at like eight p.m. before, oh, um, just by like the little bit of light that came in through the windows from the street lamps. I've done that before. Um, you know, currently I work on things that are like much more photostable, so it's not nearly as bad. I mean, honestly, when I look at things like that, I'm like, is this worth it? Because you're never going to like purify it completely. And mm. Well, a lot of stuff I worked in grad school, I mean, that was the point is that they would um, degrade and release a drug. Yeah. So that was like, you know, the main point. Uh, but again, the synthesis is tricky because you have to be, um, you know, light, everything would be wrapped in aluminum foil, mm -hmm. everything. Mm hmm. Okay, I, I think I'm going the right way, but I'm not like 100% sure. All right, we're almost yeah. at the two hour mark. Anyone yeah. just joining us, Ask a Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay Expert Science. Our guest today is Dr. Uh, uh, TJ Rorabau. Mm -hmm. Roraba, sorry. Roraba, yeah. yeah, yeah I have fine. to. No, you know your your analogy. <laughs> you should tell them your analogy for your name. Yeah, so I always uh, try to tell people it's the sound that a, a lion makes as it eats a sheep. A roraba. <laughs> roraba. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Phonetically, I would not have guessed that. No, it's not. It's not an easy one. Um, yeah. What are the What are the national origins of that? So the name is actually a German. So roar. Um, it's very common for German last names and with Ba. So where I grew up, I had a lot of German immigrants mm. as well. Um, but Ba are like Bach. You'll hear Bach or Bacher. Mm. Um, so like Rora Ba, Rora Bach, Rora Bacher all have like similar origins. Mm. Um, it's funny though, like my last name is German, but I'm, I'm mostly of um, Irish immigrants. I grew up in a coal town. So mm. a lot of my family history is in coal mining, mm. uh, which is predominantly, you know, Irish. So, okay, I just hit a checkpoint. I mean, that's... so I'm, I guess I, I finally have weaved my way oh. to, to this room. 
So they're all dead. Oh, you know what? Did I not push the button up here? Oh no, is that it? Uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be, end up being it. Nope. Wait, did I? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> no, we need a break. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Achievement oh, unlocked. I found it. There I you go. It. Terminal three. three truth and truth. reconciliation. I think you just beat it, right? Yeah, that's it. And then it's the thing. Yeah, okay. Well, sorry to the audience for watching me just run around to <laughs> do the thing I figured out. Gosh, this game is so notorious in my head for all these aimlessly walking around <laughs> looking for the door. Yeah. This was the first yeah. game that actually introduced me to speedrunning. The idea oh, of really? beating a game fast. Because there's one level, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like when you're outside and there's the snow and stuff. But you mm -hmm. jump off the bridge and jump onto a ledge and then jump all the way down. And it's really hard to do, but if you do it, it despawns all the bad guys the rest of the level. So you can just oh, sprint so through just the go. rest of it. Oh, yeah. interesting. And that was like one of the first speedrun tricks I ever learned, which is yeah, kind of fun. I've never, never done speedrunning. Mm -hmm. you know, not Derry knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. But I, I, you should look into it because it's I, I speedrun several games and it's just it's so satisfying because mm -hmm. you're just like scientific method till you figure out the fastest way to yeah. do stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that level is really long if you don't do that cheat. Absolutely. Oh, I, I bet. Um, Huggy Beer. Uh, colors are really photons reflecting at certain wavelengths, right? Yeah, I mean, um, things appear the color that they reflect, so they absorb the opposite. It's like the easiest way when you break it down. So, I mean, a material that's like super green looks that way because it reflects green but absorbs mainly red. So, you look at like a color wheel. You look across the opposite, that's what it's absorbing, mm -hmm. mainly. The thing that messed with me for a while is that so when you work in light emitting diodes, it's it's the reverse process, yeah, right? Because right. it's the yeah. light that's coming off that's generated by the source. But yeah. when you're talking about colors from reflection, it's, yeah, color wheel makes sense. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Huggy Beer. And I apologize if these are basic questions. I just don't know much about light. But photons get absorbed at some point. Do we know what happens to them? Do they break down into something slash nothing? Oof. Yeah. <laughs> that well, is a... <laughs> oh, I, I mean, yeah. a Answer that one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. It's like being back in like my defense. Or like even candidacy, like a question that will come up. But uh, so a photon is a packet of energy, right? And if some material has the appropriate ability to absorb that photon of light, it will um, absorb and go into a higher electronic state. Um, so you're basically taking whatever, you know, energy of photon, which is H nu, absorbed by your material it takes that energy and goes into a higher electronic state um, which then from there can either relax down by emitting a photon or can non radially decay which is releasing heat so it doesn't go away energy can either be created or destroyed um, unless you're talking about nuclear physics which we are not so I mean, yeah. this is one of those like really fundamental quantum questions right because yeah. it's like does a photon have mass and for most analyses, you don't say no, but yeah. it's energy, so it is mass. But like, well, it has momentum. I think that's the yeah, thing yeah. that gets you. So you have solar cells, right? Where if you put a highly um, reflective material in space and then start hitting it with light, it will start to speed up and speed up and speed up. So you potentially could get to the speed of light with a material. Yeah. So or close to. I guess you never get to it, but. They have momentum. I guess that's always the trick, right? You always just say they don't have mass, but they have momentum. Yeah. No, that's a that's a very difficult question. And I don't think we mm -hmm. fully have a grasp on how that works. Yeah. Like I've thought about that a bunch. It's like, do orbitals exist if they're not occupied with electrons? Uh, well, they're virtual, so. <laughs> yeah, they're, <laughs> whatever that means. And if yeah, you talk to a, a, a pure quantum chemist, they'll be like, orbitals aren't real anyway. No, <laughs> they're, just, they're, they're approximations. Yeah. I mean, everything we do is to the 90, what's the cutoff for orbitals? 99%? Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know off the top of my head. Yeah. Non-dairy neutrino, kind of broaching on the measurement problem, i.e., um, when does a wave function collapse? Oh. <laughs> uh, do you want to go back to the kissing fish question? Yeah, I think it's a <laughs> uh, guppy. <laughs> Man, you know, these are really. I mean, when you when you talked about like the the quantum electrodynamics, that's yeah. the questions they would start talking about. Cause, oh yeah, I'm just not I'm not sure. Yeah, like I I feel like my knowledge on that is so superficial. Like every day I work with something that absorbs light, or at least I think about it and talk right. about it. But like, what happens to that? You have uh, electromagnetic field that oscillates an electric field on a molecule. Mm. And then that 
disappears, I guess. Yeah, I mean, all energy goes somewhere. But in terms of, like, I don't, I don't know about, like... Yeah, this is where my quantum knowledge kind of drops off, like, completely. It's like, wave functions collapse, I'm not sure. All right, 814 is going to save us from this oh. question, but ask an equally hard one. What is your burning question as a scientist? What are the ultimate questions or problems you want to help solve? Oh, man. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to, like, because, again, to, like, application-based and stuff is, like, hard to, like, really get into. Um, but, I mean, like, a, a big thing that's, like, interesting that's, like, kind of tangential to the work we're doing, like, we're making, like, potentially OLED materials. Like, how can we make materials that just perform better at redder and redder wavelengths when you're fighting, you know, different properties like the energy gap law? So the idea is as you get a material that absorbs redder light and emits a redder light, they tend to have really low emission quantum yields. And it's like, what tricks can we do synthetically to make uh, compounds that actually still are emissive? I like it, that, and that's something that you work on a lot is yeah. how do you make materials that still can use low energy light to do interesting processes? So mm -hmm. in terms of like a greater scientific thing, that's, that's a very hard problem. And I'm always trying to make better and better materials. So. Yeah, it's underappreciated how much light matters in your life, like not just screens and stuff, but it's something like energy consumption in the US, 30% of it goes towards lighting or something ridiculous mm. like that. Like if you make a more efficient LED, like that saves a whole lot of energy and solves some of our energy related issues. All right, Huggy Beer. Oh, so a photon is a packet, so how does it have a wavelength? What does a packet oscillate through space on its own, mm. not just traveling in a straight line? Ooh, wave particle duality. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's both. Um, <laughs> it's both is the short answer. It's both. I was actually just watching, a, oh, jeez, now there's like so many invisible ones. Um, I was just watching a video on like this idea of light, um, you know, acting as a wave and diffracting around an object. So like, if you had very um, collimated light and you know it's so like all um you know all very directional um on a perfectly round object do you know where the brightest spot of the shadow should be no it should be actually in the center so if light is diffracting around it it should go focus on it should yeah, focus yeah. around into the center so yeah, that yeah. should actually be the brightest spot and that was like um part of some like academic competition of like a interesting science thing years ago mm -hmm. it was like fundamental stuff um and i i know i'm feeling because i don't remember the name of the scientist uh, but it's actually named after the professor who said it's impossible hmm. uh, i i wish i remembered now um it's just a short like one-off video isn't that when's when's pr principle or something uh, it's like, when? oh it's italian i forget the name oh man but it's like um start with a p or a b but it's like someone's spot mm. and it's an idea and they they haven't been able to prove it until more recently when you know you have better directional light so if you take a laser and shine it around a spherical object the shadow will have a small bright uh, point in the yeah. middle so it's it's one of those things that's like funny it's like you got named for not the person who came up with it but the person who said it wouldn't happen <laughs> <laughs> we take those. Yeah. <laughs> uh, rarely do you get something named after you that actually sticks, so yeah. we'll count that as a victory. I have to look. I should have looked it up. I was actually talking about it like the other day, and I just can't remember the name now. Fresnel. 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 Yeah, Fresnel spot. Yes. Yes. Uh, Fresnel lenses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or no, actually, I think Fresnel. Fresnel was the one who came up with it. It's named after a different scientists who said it wouldn't happen I oh think the actual like a, spot okay. yeah the actual spot but it, it was the, he was the scientist that first like said that this was a possibility poisson yes i think that's right i don't know someone's quicker out there with wikipedia than i am oh, and i was out of shots argo spot yeah it had multiple names but i think the one that yeah was on spot yeah no that's it yeah the shadow in the middle yeah fresno or but it was fresno who came up with it but they got more colloquially named yeah that's just one of those like 
<laughs> funny things. I, I didn't know about it, so I was just looking at a random video. King Willie, welcome back to the stream. Opening strong. If the Covenant's enemy shields were real, <laughs> would them taking damage cause their color to change across the visible spectrum? Oh, man. I, <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> like, what would cause that color change? I mean, what would even cause these to work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, King Willie, you broke us. <laughs> it's I mean, too late it, in the night for us to answer that. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I think a bigger question is why can't you pick up the sword in Halo 1, but you can in Halo 2? That's a you know? good question. Yeah, these are. Master Chief got stronger. Yeah. <laughs> We're calling that the lore. Yeah. Man, the shields. Light shields, why they'd change color. Honestly, they'd probably change color out of like some convenience indicator or something. Yeah, to know that they're like lowering. Yeah, like it's a, you have a secondary box yeah. that has stimuli response that changes the wavelength that's emitted. Not a physical phenomenon, but like a feedback loop. Yeah, but from tactical, that's like a bad idea to yeah. let your enemy know that your shield is decreasing in power. It's, it's for you to watch yourself slowly die yeah. in front of your face. Uh, uh, good question, though, King Willie. We yeah, I don't, I don't know if there would be anything that would ever do that. <laughs> All right, Ecstatica wants to know, what's the highest quantum yield for a material that emits in the IR? Let's say something like 2,000 nanometers. All the quantum yields I see are always less than 1%. Yeah, that far is really hard. I mean, my my familiarity is with like iridium complexes, which are, I mean, you're lucky to get 10% in the uh, greater than 700 regime. Yeah, it's very rare. So it's rare. really low. Energy gap yeah. law just it really Gosh, screws it. you. Right? Yeah, you, there's ways around it, but I mean, you can only make things so redshifted. I mean, the problem is that you have, uh, sorry to dive in on this, but you have harmonic modes that are essentially like CH vibrations, yeah. CC vibrations that are just inherently going to kill you in that region. But this is also discussing only molecules, right? There's solid state. I mean, any emitter that you have that's good in the near IR is going to mm -hmm. be not molecular in all likelihood. No, it's, uh, it's just so difficult in terms of like, I'm going the wrong way. Now they give me an indicator. Uh, yeah. It felt bad. Yeah, I was like, oh, you're going 150 meters away. Uh, yeah, no, it's like a big difficulty. And there, there's a lot of like tricks and things you can do. But like at some point, your excited state potential well is going to intersect your ground state well at a small enough activation barrier that you're just going to have not rated decay rates that are super fast. Yeah. And that was a big one we had in grad school working on those near IR OLEDs. Like you're, you're not in the visible anymore. You get massive losses due to non-rated big oh captain oh, keys yeah. eats it respawned <laughs> so we're at 1009 i'm yeah. guessing 20 minutes on an arc so you have i don't know roughly 25 to 30 minutes left okay. you want to keep playing this you want to change up to something else uh you know i mean oh jeez <laughs> Uh, I mean, after that, yeah, maybe, maybe worth uh, trying something different, but it's going to be more aimless walking if we move the leg. Um, I mean, let's, let's, oh, let's keep doing it. You're nostalgic. Let's go. I got, I, I, the nostalgia is strong. I think I just... I mean, we can skip ET tonight. And... Yeah, I, I, you know, I was really hoping to, you have know... You, have you ever played it? I've, I've only seen the videos, oh especially God. the very good documentary oh, where yeah, they yeah. found all of the buried <laughs> uh, ET uh, cartridges. That's a really good one. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've seen the videos of the play, and I, I'd like to not get stuck in a, a hole. <laughs> Looking for Reese's Pieces. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you can find an emulator online. Someone should play a little bit of uh, ET for the Atari. Atari 2600 It's a classic. Um, Huggy Beer, uh, you've talked about red and IR a few times. Is that where people are mostly working, not ultraviolet? Hmm. I mean, it like, depends on like what the application space you're thinking of. So it's there's a lot of things that emit really high in the visible. Like, you look at dyes, you have quantum yields that are extremely high. Um, but when you're looking at ultraviolet and like you know near UV, I mean, a lot of people are making photo redox uh photosensitizers so uh, like we might have mentioned it earlier like uh iridium complexes for photo redox that got a nobel prize mm -hmm. not too long ago um and but those you know they're absorbing high energy light to do redox chemistry so i mean they want people. to move high energy electrons around you need high energy light, exactly right yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and it helps to make bond breaking events 
by having higher energy. But like your 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 work with Claudia, like the the biological tissue window is really cool. Which yeah, you elaborate on a little because most people don't know this exists. <laughs> yeah, so I to dwell back into the past a bit. Um, the photodynamic therapy window. Um, uh, the way is always described in the group is if you took a fat flashlight and put it over your hand you would only see reddish orange light pass through. And that's because your tissue does not absorb that wavelength of light. Um, so if you're making materials that you want to be photoactive, you would do that in that regime um, to have the highest tissue permeating light. Um, so a big struggle was to make materials that would, when shined with red light, um, degrade or have bond breaking events. Um, so you could deliver a drug. So something that's non-active in the dark, but then active when you radiate light. And we were actually, um, while I was in grad school, we designed some materials that were able to do um, photo-induced ligand exchange, which is the process that does the drug delivery in the near IR. So there's a chem side paper uh, from 2017, 2018, that came out uh, in that time that had near IR uh, performance that was um, high enough quantum yields that would be usable. Um, but yeah, in terms of like regimes, you're, you're dealing with such low energy light that to get something to work, um, to do some bond breaking event is actually very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Go Haku. I heard Atari 2600 will be re-released. Can't wait. Like original hardware. I mean, they've made like the USB versions of the Atari 2600 that you guys can buy. I think they're available now, but I'm, that's crazy if they're re-released. Oh man. Oh, geez. All right. Ecstatica. So, are we going over the fish question tomorrow or what? <laughs> That's the student that'll be in your seminar. Yeah. <laughs> Do yeah. you want somebody to ask that? It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll research tonight. <laughs> I'll do an extension I'll, I'll, investigation. I'll throw it on, uh, yeah, as running through the slides, making sure I, I stay in time. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure I play. What fish I, I mean, guess. speaking of slides, you have to get your, your talks, your posters, they have to be approved. Yeah, everything is approved ahead of time. Um, there's a lot about, I don't know if I'm hitting the wrong button. I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but like, that's one of the things that's different. I remember as a grad student, like if you gave a talk, you were crunching slides like up until you gave it. I know I've seen a lot of professors, uh, you know, Editing wow, the, the talk's about to come up. They're <laughs> they're editing slides like right beforehand. So yep. we, we're we're not at that luxury. We have to have everything approved ahead of time. Um, I mean, working on like what we're gonna say, we can we can do. But in terms of like, yeah, sometimes you're just kind of uh, stuck with the slides you have. Yeah, and that process is different. Every lab has different procedures. So what? How long is your approval time on that when you submit? Uh, so if you know how to work the system, yeah, it could be like a couple weeks, but it, it takes time. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Work the system as in you know the person approving? No, you know the timeline. That's see, uh, the trick, is getting things in at the right time. Um, but that's, uh, that's how it is everywhere when you have these extra approval processes. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And on a journey, anyone just joining us, Ask a Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay Expert Science. Our guest today is uh, TJ Rorba, who's an uh, expert at photochemistry, photophysics, and also is a research chemist at Army Research Laboratory, uh, DEVCOM Army Research Laboratory, working on DOD-related problems that he can't necessarily give details on, but he can talk generalities on photophysics, molecules that absorb light, uh, the right, properties yeah. after they absorb light, is, is things he's definitely interested in. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have any questions, color chemistry, where color comes from, molecules, cutting edge technology he is happy to answer any questions you may have yeah it's wow. still uh, again it's like weird to be called an expert in photo chemistry <laughs> we'll say among the people in the audience yeah. you are the foremost expert as yeah. far as i can tell we don't know who's watching no oh, yeah no i mean <laughs> oh, well, oh that yeah well that's my fault i threw that grenade oh man oh. i forgot how hard this was because yeah. you gotta keep Yourself and keeps. Um, you can totally edit slides with technologies these days like smartphones. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but if you present non improved stuff, you get in yeah. trouble. 
Yeah. Man, it blows my mind when people, have you seen people presenting from their cell phones? Like they'll hook it up to HDMI. I've seen people like where like the controller slide progressor is their phone. Yeah. Which is pretty interesting of a, uh, Oh, we do it like where like the red dot instead of having a laser pointer, the, the slide is on their phone and they just touch the slide. Yeah. That's pretty cool. But that was also like when I was in grad school. That's not that new of technology. I mean, but it's, I, that's so intimidating for me because like you get a phone call <laughs> or like, I don't know. There's too many things that can go wrong with that, but I'm just, yeah. Yeah, terrified. right. Stick with my dedicated laser pointer clicker. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the laser pointer. It's good. Yeah. Logitech R800. <laughs> this stream brought to you by Logitech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. actually advice I give to every one of my students in class. Like I make them present mm -hmm. when they I teach a graduate class, mm -hmm. but like buy your own presenter, right? Because yeah. you're going to present enough. You should know it like the back of your hand, not bumblefuck mm -hmm. through slides and like laser pointers and stuff. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Still rocking my Logitech clicker pointer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I bought one when I first arrived at FSU, like one of the new green laser pointers. And after 10 years, it died. Oh, no. Like it was just the, the it was the buttons. They just got worn out. And so I mean, you're talking, you know, tens of thousands of slides. Like, oh, geez. It just happens. But what yeah. pisses me off the most uh, is. So the old laser pointer was 532 nanometers, you know, the bright, vibrant green. I got the exact same one, and it's like 515. Like the slightly blue. Oh, brain. yeah. It's not. I have a 532. Okay. Logitech. Uh, oh, and it's the old school pistol. No, you need. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> I do miss the 2x zoom because they got rid of that. And because because Halo 2 is when they did the. Um, the dual wheeling. The dual wheel. Yep. So they got rid of the uh, 2x zoom. So this 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 weapon anyone not familiar with halo was so polarizing to the community like it's the halo one players loved it anyone that started beyond that it was too overpowered and they hated it kind of thing it was, it was a very contentious oh just hit a nope that's my own bad there's another grenade that i threw badly there we go all right i'll eventually get there uh yeah King Willy, Wiimote, the best laser pointer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man. I would I would pay to see that. I would love to see someone present through oh 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 we <laughs> Um Statica, the best fifty dollars I spend in grad school. Yeah, it pays for itself. If you get yeah, enough cocks, it's definitely worth it. Hey yeah. It's just it like perception matters, and if you screw up your PowerPoint because of a pointer, it looks, it reflects bad on you. Like that's the bottom line. So, Statica, kudos, kudos to you for buying a laser pointer. Everyone else, you should do the same because you're going to present a lot. Yeah, I still have the same 532 Logitech one I got in grad school. Yeah. And so it, it's like six years old. I'm so jealous of that 532 That's wavelength. So nice. <laughs> I'll show you it tomorrow because it's just. Yeah, I'll have to see that. I don't think I've seen one of the more bluer ones. Yeah, it's just tragically disappointing. So, yeah, any of my students that are in class, I hate my laser pointer. It's a bluish green instead of a solid green. Do they not make 532 anymore? Is that I, just the so one that's the thing. Make? I looked up the specs on it, and it, it said 532 on their specs website. And I bought it directly from Logitech, but apparently mm. they're doing 515. Interesting. Um, not Dairy Neutrino. Ah, Silent cart Cartographer, arguably the most iconic level in the game, maybe even the franchise. I do, I do like because this is the first time you drive a warthog, yep. isn't it? Yeah. So there's a really badass shortcut on this. So you'll you'll get up to it, but the door you have to get to here that locks, mm -hmm. and then you have to go to the center of the level to get through. Turns out you can do the warthog, drive it, and actually shoot yourself through the door and skip it. And you it, when you clip through it, it eliminates the bad guys. It's a really awesome speedrun strat. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> um, meanwhile, Blood Gulch is the definitive Halo map. Yes. I do like the, Blood Gulch. With the pistol and sniper. Yeah, and then they did Sidewinder. It was a Sidewinder, Sidewinder that yeah, was yeah. the Blood Gulch, but Winter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that one. That was a good one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, No, Blood Gulch and Hang em High on Halo 1 were the, were the levels. Yeah, I remember when, was it, when did Forge come out? Was that Halo 2? Or is that Halo 3? I think it was Halo 3, like where you could go and make your own maps. I want to say Halo 3. Yeah, I remember my friends would, would go on Forge, they'd make a map where there was like screens, so you had sides, and then we'd do laser tag where you took the splicer, <laughs> yeah. which is like the laser cannon. Yeah, that was a good time. But like, if you started on one side, you couldn't get to the other one, so it was like yeah, yeah. to find teams. No, there were some fun, like paintball games and <laughs> rockets across the map. 
All right, Ecstatica, if you're still rocking a red laser pointer, I low-key judge you. <laughs> Green is much more noticeable than red. Oh, that's a, a photopic response. The, 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 the optical response peaks in like 532 nanometers. Yeah, it's weird that that just like works out. Yeah, I mean it makes sense from an evolutionary like green plants, and that's where mm -hmm. you need to be able to see things. So yeah, green laser pointer. <sighs> Stupid 515 nanometers. Yeah, that's weird. I just never, I've never, I don't think I, I probably have seen one and be like, that's just not a bright laser. Pointer. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It doesn't feel right. Well, yeah. I'll show you tomorrow. Huggy Beer, how many <laughs> gifts of cats would one put in their presentation? More or less than five for every ten minutes of talk. <laughs> How many? How many? Uh, I have no KRL approved uh, uh, slides. Do you have with that? You cat? know, I do not have any approved cat memes <laughs> or gifts in mine. I will tell you that the Army Corps of Engineers produces a cat calendar every year um, <laughs> that I have seen. That's pretty funny. Um, it's a bunch of cats and bridges and stuff. So if you're if you're looking for Army related cat uh, memes, that's that's your go-to. Go Haku, why buy a new pointer? Don't you have to pair it? Uh, no, the new pointer was uh, my buttons ran out and also the battery life was starting to get really bad. So I don't know if that was an LED issue or something else, in the, the, but I mean, using it for thousands and thousands of slides, it adds up. So yeah, I'm so annoyed. Uh, wasn't Sidewinder, Sidewinder super huge? Yeah, that was the big snow one. You could go through the center or around. Right? Okay, maybe that's not the Blood Gulch then, like, revamp one. But I do remember that because I was like... Sidewinder, what was it called? What, yeah, what was it called in the newer Halos? Because that was it. It was like, they made a second one. Yeah, it was Blood Gulch-like. It had the two bases on opposite yeah. sides. Yeah. No, I thought that was... Oh, Valhalla. Valhalla. Okay. Yeah, that, I think it was Valhalla. Yeah. Because I was like, that was the map for, like, um shoddy snipes that was like the good one because it was like enough of like close quarter stuff but like you could weave through like the um tunnels on the one side <laughs> king willie nah 405 405 nanometers is where it's at leave a green trail on the phosphorescent paint yeah God, it's so hard to look at those pointers oh okay. the bright blue like yeah, borderline uv i don't really see many 405s i know if you um if you buy a pair of glasses from Sunny Optical and you get the blue reflecting coating, mm -hmm. they send you a, a 405 laser. What? Just to test it? Yeah, it's like, oh, here, test this. Don't wear your glasses when you do it. But, <laughs> but you could. But you could. Stand by our product. Yeah. It's like, oh. So that door right there, if you bring a warthog down here and like oh, run and right. slide, you can actually exit the vehicle through the door. Oh, geez. Yeah. So it's a, a glitch. Okay, yeah, I remember. Yeah, you, yeah, you got to go through. find the cartographer. Yep, in the center. Yep. Oh, know way too much about this game. Yeah. There's, like, there's like five games I know really well, and this is one of them. I, I love it. it was a, it's a good one. It's reminiscent. Like really, I have a 405, and I love it. Yes, but your audience hates you, and you should feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, it works. It also, like, one of those things is, like, it works well um, if you're not, like, at an off-angle reflect. <laughs> yeah, I know that's true. Because you can, I mean, even the five, anything that's, like, five milliwatt can still cause, like, um, not damage because your re your responses should be faster mm -hmm. than the damage from one of those, but it can still you know be uncomfortable for your audience to view. So yeah, definitely want to be careful. I Large mean, lecture halls shouldn't be an issue. But. And that's that's the advantage of the five thirty two because that's like peak receptor, so you can do lower intensity. Exactly. If you're doing four hundred five, you have to do a higher intensity laser to get the same photon flux or visible right. response. So yeah, yeah. Ecstatica, the speed running brain is coming out. Yes, absolutely. I have a few yeah. passions in this world, <laughs> and Ask a Scientist okay. Gaming combines many of them into one. Drinking, gaming, and <laughs> science. So, <laughs> you get to see Ken at his core. <laughs> mm. But yeah, if you guys have any questions, we have about 35 minutes left oh, on yeah. stream. Um, Cuddle Puppy, Ken, do you have any noteworthy speedrunning placements? <laughs> Thank you, Cuddle Puppy. They do know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was uh, 178th in, in Super Mario Brothers oh, 1, crazy. and so I, that was my peak position at 5 minutes and 2 seconds, and now I'm not even top 600 anymore, and that was 5 years ago, which is crazy. It's a 35-year-old game, and people are still beating me at it, but <laughs> Cattle Puppy, I know what you're getting to. We'll save it for later. I'll let you reveal it. Yeah. Uh, um... 
We watched the, the documentary of Fistful of Quarters. Oh man, it's not speed run, but it's uh, you we know. have talked about that many times on I love, the stream. Okay, that's such a good documentary. So I had um, Andy Opal from the uh, communications department, who's a professor that does like documentary filmmaking and stuff. And so we brought up uh, Fistful of Quarters, but it's such a great like story. You yeah, know? it's such a yeah, it is. It, it, I like that. It's, so I, he, I guess for people who aren't in the know, yeah, if they're not like me, go watch it. Yeah, it's very really good. Like, yeah, so it's about the the highest score in Donkey Kong. I guess it's a as a short King look for it, right? Kong, fist full of quarters. So yeah, if you guys haven't seen, it, I mean, even if you don't care about Donkey Kong world records or whatever, like it's just such a King of Kong. There we go. Mm -hmm. It's just such great storytelling. The good guys are good. The bad guys are bad. Like, you know who to root for. Like, you just, you can't write it any better. So have mm -hmm. you followed up on this uh, any after this? No, I have So heard Billy it. Mitchell, the bad guy in yeah. that, he has recently been stripped of all his world records. And there's lawsuits pending against uh, people who basically brought that to the forefront. He basically tried to get the record back, but he was not using standard hardware. He used an emulator, an emulator that like artificially gave him additional advantages. Yeah. And so when that came to the forefront and like YouTubers were exposing him for this, he's tried to sue them for defamation. And so oh. there's, there's a huge like court battle going back. Uh, it's him and I can't remember the historian. Somebody, somebody in chat might know his name. Um, it's not summoning salt. It's Carl Jobs. There we go. Carl Jobs is a YouTuber that co covers video games. Like, that's his job. And so he has these two pending lawsuits with Billy Mitchell. So, yeah, the bad guy continued to be bad. Shocking. I mean, I think in the, the documentary, it's like the big question is like, did the, um, the video he produced, like, was it edited or something, right? That was like a big st yep. sticking point. Yeah. So, yeah. It's definitely a very good one. I like documentaries, so that's a that's all right. Catching up, ecstatic. Is Dr. De Prince better at speedrunning Mario Brothers one than me? <laughs> no, he's not. So it started out as a joke where we were playing more like Mario one Christmas break or something, and then it turned into a competition. And he peaked at three hundred and something, and I peaked at one hundred and seventy-five. So yeah. I beat Eugene in, in uh speedrunning. Go Haku, do they make rechargeable laser pointers? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they're all like batteries. So. Yeah, all I use is Logitech. So I think that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I think you're more likely that you're gonna like run into issues with like the like you're saying the buttons wearing out, not mm -hmm. clicking anymore. Um. Yeah, because you're all just like double A or triple A battery ran, right? Yep. 814 Law. You both are very accomplished. Well, thank you. <laughs> we talked about imposter syndrome earlier. Yeah. It's like, and it's hard to watch other people like achieve other things and like get awards and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it always like makes you second guess yourself. But anyway, I, I, I imagine your career paths were not easy to reach. How did slash do you overcome challenges and cope with setbacks? Yeah, I mean, I guess like it. What's interesting now, like the age I'm at, is that a lot of people who like I went to grad school with are like a couple years younger than me. Now they're professors. They're becoming professors at like large universities mm -hmm. and stuff. And that's really weird because we took very different career paths, mm -hmm. you know. And I think there's like a little bit more of like accolade that comes with being a professor, you know, because like your whole life you spend in academia, so you, like you, you always, you know, look upon academic professors as like higher status and stuff yeah. like that. Um, so that's interesting, uh, you know, being a yeah, you know, research chemist at a government lab, though, like, I think there's still a lot to be, um, you know, happy about with that. But now, like, dealing with, like, failures and stuff, I mean, I'm, I'm in the lab, I'm making my compounds, and if one fails, I just move on to the next set that I think is going to work. So, like, that, that helps me cope with it. Because even, like, every failure, is, I learned something. I learned that those molecules did not work. So... You have that mindset on it. There's not really any failures. You're always learning. So, I mean, that's the lens you have to take. And we, we talked about this earlier, like doing undergrad research is absolutely pivotal to decide if you want to go to grad school because, man, we fail, what, 95% of the time? All the time. And you take those 5% successes and carry you to the next failure. Yeah, always take a win. <laughs> yep. 
it's really those those minor wins that have to take you forward and this is i've seen this before too like there are a lot of 4.0 gpa students that cannot cope with grad school because it's not you can't be right all the time you can't have the answer you just fail and fail and fail and it's it's hard to deal with if you're not used to it yeah when you think something's gonna work and it doesn't that's uh not great this is up to uncle bill welcome back it's been a while um those of you not familiar, there's a pretty large educational streaming community. Um, Uncle Bill is one of the co-founders of uh, something known as the Knowledge Fellowship. It's basically a Discord channel where you can you can look up fellow scientific related streamers. This is chemistry, biology, geology, whatever it might be, and we're part of the Knowledge Fellowship. And so, yeah, there's a there's a pretty substantial network. Twitch is not just for video game streaming; it's also for you know arts and crafts and science mm -hmm. education and all sorts of different things. And so we kind of bridge both of those gaps. But yeah, check out. The knowledge fellowship if you're interested in more science streamers i mean there's i don't know i don't know how deep you've gotten into this tj but like mm -hmm. there's people that fix watches on streams they do no, yeah. cutting, like yeah i actually said this is not my first uh twitch experience actually so i mentioned my sister is a professor in psychology at utsa she also has a twitch stream it's called uh prof talk where um they are interviewing people uh so field psychology mainly or people who have gotten like psychology phds and moved into different career fields um i got brought on because i think she just needed to uh fill a spot and uh, just talk about government research and and stuff like that so kind of like today mm -hmm. uh, you know like job talk stuff so there's another one out there uh oh no my uh dot org on the knowledge fellowship is broken try this instead yeah, you guys can read uh, Bill's comment there. Oh, puppy, my favorite type of science is Scientology. You know, <laughs> science because it's in the name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, cuddle puppy. <laughs> Don't touch that one. <laughs> it's, it's too much at stake. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, we have a raid from Samuel, Samuel Animates. Samuel, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the stream. I hope your stream went well. What were you guys up to tonight? Um, but yeah, those of you just joining, uh, Ask Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay, uh, Expert Science. Uh, we do our best. Imposter yeah. Syndrome is very real. Yeah. <laughs> but tonight we have uh, uh, TJ Rohrbach, who's uh, expert in photochemistry and photophysics. He also works at the Army Research Laboratory. So if you guys have any questions related to color chemistry, light interacting with matter, uh, feel free to, to throw those questions in chat. But Samuel, thank you very much for the raid. It's a pleasure um, having another member of the the streaming community join us all right we're slowly running out of time we're yes. at 10 34. what do you think your narc time is going to be so uh, the range is between 17 minutes and 30 seconds and 38 minutes uh i think it's gonna be on the longer run i think we should probably swap now <laughs> i think you're underestimating your abilities on this uh, I, I think i understand but i'm not a i'm not a player so. note that a non-trivial portion of our guests have not played video games in 30 years uh, so well, it, you have you have something on that front I am I am 32, so I have played video games in 30 years. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, that's pretty amazing. All right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I can switch to NARC and give it a shot. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll be able to make it through. Uncle yeah. Bill, the .org was a, under, a prototype under construction. It hadn't been working in a couple of years. Now security certs are expired also. Okay, I'll have to update everything. Uh, Samuel, stream was good. Just tried several games uh, uh, on the Playdate handheld. I have not uh, seen the Playdate handheld. That's fun. Is that just an HDMI hookup that you do to the, uh, the like capture card? Ooh, Samuel has a fun follow-up. Okay, for a question. What is a common misconception people have about your field? Oh. Fields could be broadly defined. That could yeah, be chemistry, yeah. that could be I don't know. ARL. I, think, I don't know. I think like um I mean a lot with chemistry, I think, you know, you probably have to deal with this a lot more. Mm. It's like right after Breaking Bad came out. It's like <laughs> everyone, especially as a synthetic chemist, like first question is like, could you make meth? And it's like Yeah. Yeah, huh? <laughs> I have I'm, not that far. I'm not gonna say that. Far. Anyway, I mean, like, it, I think what's funny about Breaking Bad is that like it actually had really good mm -hmm. uh, chemistry, except for like, so the whole time he's talking, so there's the chirality talk, mm -hmm. which is very good. Like yeah, that yeah. is that is a very good uh, discussion on chirality and how molecules have shapes. 
um, and and they interact differently in biology. So very good, uh, except for that the like benzene ring they have drawn in the background is wrong. <laughs> it doesn't have a Texas carbon in it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's got yeah, it's got a carbon that's a little bigger, and it's just like you did such a good job. Yeah, yeah. and, and then like, you did that, and then one drawing just being so bad. Yeah, so. Credit to the writers, writers and Brian Cranston. No, yeah. so they actually consulted chemists. I actually know somebody. I, I was at University of Southern California when they were writing that. Like, I know mm -hmm. the people they consulted with. They made sure, and they were very clever about it. They, they tried to make it realistic, but also not give enough details that people could actually make meth from it. So, right, right. Yeah. No, I, I think, like, when they go and get, like, methylamine, yeah. like, that's, like, a huge different, like, like it's a correct and very good, like, um, story writing about it. And of course, like Sudafed and stuff, like that's. Yeah, I mean but, that's very real. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly it's done in garbage cans and not <laughs> beakers and flasks and whatnot. Yeah. But. Yeah, but they take like such detail to talk about like beakers being called like the Griffin beaker versus like different types. It's like I've never heard anyone use the term Griffin beaker. <laughs> True. Before. <laughs> One thing I will shit on is that his his pure meth had a blue tint to it. Which it would not. No. If it was pure. Yeah, not at that's all. A... coloration. <laughs> no, that's an impurity. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I mean, depending on the impurity, it might be a blue, but blue is a hard color to make accidentally. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Because you have to absorb red and green and let blue through essentially. So, yeah. Yeah, I always found that funny. <laughs> no, that's a good one, though. Yeah, I think that's, I think all chemists everywhere after that have been affected. Yeah, well, one of my reviews yeah. for my class, and I say this every single syllabus day, is uh, Ken Hansen is the Walter White of chemistry. His skills are wasted in the classroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, is that a compliment? <laughs> No, Lori, I, she's requested two factoids now, and I haven't caught up. So I'm going to transition to NARC. If you're okay. willing to yeah. answer a factoid or deliver a factoid, Lori wants to know. Lori, welcome back to the stream. Always a pleasure. Thank mm -hmm. you for joining us. Thank you for spending your internet units on requesting a factoid. Yeah. Oh, I know. I like I had some prepared, and now my mind is just like running blank. But <laughs> no pressure. Actually, uh, there's a lot of pressure. There's yeah, there's I know. Literally dozens of people watching. I just there's <laughs> dozens of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I think. All right. So is, is it okay to steal another? Yeah, uh, yeah I'll go ahead. Yeah. We haven't put the prediction up. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, a lot of the stuff we work with uh, is iridium because there's a lot of good a pho uh, photo uh, physical. Uh, properties that those complexes have, but iridium is one of the most expensive um, uh, materials. So actually, well, we can save this because we can say it. But um, one of the coolest factoids that I know is that iridium is not naturally occurring on the Earth um, in high abundancy. So the only place that we mine iridium is actually from asteroids, mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the major reasons why we think dinosaurs um, went extinct after a cataclysmic asteroid event is that at the KT boundary, there is a huge amount of iridium deposits. Mm -hmm. So there's a factoid. I didn't steal that one, so. <laughs> All right, well, before you yeah. go into this, I have a treat for you guys tonight. Anyone familiar with the stream, uh, Ask a Scientist Gaming, it started as a joke, now it's become a tradition that I make every guest play NARC at the end of the night. <laughs> and the reason this exists is because when I first was a guest on my own stream, I played NARC, and this was a bargain bin game from when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And then it started out as a challenge. They challenged me to speed run it. And at one point, I was the world record holder at NARC. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why I forced my guests to play this and play time. But tonight, uh -huh. we have a special treat. So when we we had a hurricane last week. I went to Destin just to get away because we have, I mean, you saw the trees around this house. They're pretty massive. They're yeah. like 50 foot trees and the risk of those hitting the house. We're like, we're just going to go away for two or three days. But anytime I go somewhere to visit, I hit up retro video game stores and I found this guy. And so this is a, is an original copy, a complete copy of NARC. And so this is the game plus the, uh, plus the, the pamphlet, plus the actual game still in its wrapper. And so I'm going to read the back for you guys. So just to prep you for what you're about oh, to I'm, experience. I'm, I'm excited. You are Max Force. Your mission, bust Mr. Big and destroy all, all his dreaded criminal empire. Seize all contraband, stolen money, illegal weapons, use rockets, high-powered machine guns, apprehend all suspects, protect the innocent, and punish the guilty. Stop at nothing. So, <laughs> Narc Lord does run deep, and we have the user manual for each character. Oh. Are you ready for this, TJ? Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to go under right. 20 minutes. Let's I'll finish it. it by the end of the stream. <laughs> oh, I got the timer. If you yeah. don't see it, do you want me to move it off screen? Or no, you no, keep it? it right there. We'll, we'll... All right. Just Let's try it. do it. Press start, right. and it's time. So, the clock starts as soon as you hit the ground. And remember, your goal is to walk right and hit doors as quickly as you can. Yeah. Ready. Mm -hmm. 
So no advantage in killing guys. Uh, two buttons, hold A to shoot, tap A to rocket, tap B to jump, hold B to squat. Go right, find doors as quickly as possible. How much did that copy of NARC cost? It looks extremely expensive. So it, it's an original copy. It's not It's not like original seal. That's just they put a plastic case on it. So I got this for $40. So not like an original Mario 3 or anything like that. Believe it or not, NARC is not a particularly pop popular game among the collecting community. <laughs> but I do have an additional fun one that I found at the same store, actually. And so this is a copy of E.T. for the Atari. <laughs> so I paid 10 bucks to get a version of E.T. for the Atari which is a notoriously bad game for the Atari 2600 system, but I had to own it, even yeah, though I have an Atari. It's classic. <laughs> I need that moment in time. Again, another great documentary about gaming. It's the <laughs> E.T. What was the name of that one? Uh, Lost. Oh, wait. I not get the card? I gotta insert it. That's right. There we go. Okay. <laughs> you could have got a free copy of E.T. by digging a hole in the yeah. Arizona desert. <laughs> Uh, it's called Atari Game Over. Yeah, that's a very good one. Yeah, that's a pretty spectacular. Yeah, I think another um, very good video, uh, another video game one that just recently came out was uh, Tetris. Oh yeah, it's a pretty good one. There's also like a bunch of like non-mass produced like YouTube documentaries on like the founding and stuff that's not as dramatized. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that story. Yeah, I love video game historians. Yeah, I like that Tetris really is, is Tetra for the Greek the Greek four and tennis for the guy like tennis, even though I had nothing to do with tennis. So that was so I saw that movie and the, the thing that struck me most is it, it was based on like a block game that had five cubes or something, and he said five was too complex. There's too many pieces, so I'm going to use four instead. Mm -hmm. So it was like based on a previous game that existed that I didn't know. Oh, really? yeah, but yeah. Uh, Check out uh, Atari Game Over. Uh, it, it talks about how this game almost ruined the video game industry for a long period of time. So yeah, you gotta shoot the black guys at close range, the guys wearing black at close range, and one of them will drop a blue card. No. So this is what we call in the speedrun community is RNG, random number generated. Oh, so you picked up, I I picked up picked heroin up. or money. Oh, I didn't pick up the... Okay. <laughs> yeah. I got closer to these guys. Right. That's money. All right, so while you're oh, focusing on that, we it. owe Lori another factoid. Jeez. <laughs> I, saw, I saw her ride. So. <laughs> uh, hmm. Do you know the um, how long a, a ray of, from the sun takes to get to the Earth? Ooh. If it was walking on sunshine? I do, but does the audience yeah. know? Yeah, I believe it's... Um, it, how many times would walking on sunshine play as the photon of light? Do you, do you, did you ever hear this? I, no, believe I, it's, I believe it's three times. Yeah. Because it's about nine minutes. Yeah, I'll give your set eight minutes. Yeah. So walking on sunshine, would, it would, a photon would be able to play three three runs of it. I've heard the time before, but not in reference to a song. Uh, so you want to be on the bottom, yeah, and you're going to run into bombs. Oh, come on. But yeah, eight minutes. That's pretty breathtaking, because if the sun blinks out, we don't know for eight minutes. Yeah. And then all life on Earth eventually ends. I think that's a, that's a good fact there, yeah. Samuel. Oh, for a second, I thought you meant this game specifically almost ruined, ruining the gaming industry. No, it was the E.T. game, but this one was one of the uh, ones that caused the, the game rating system and the backlash against video games in like the early 90s and things like that. Oh, this was this was originally an arcade game. It's actually much better for the arcade in terms of visual and gameplay. Uh, the NES, NES dumbed it down a lot, got rid of the blood, got rid of the, a lot of the explosion mm -hmm. violence, but still got some backlash. Similarly, wouldn't uh, sim similarly wouldn't be ejected due to the lack of gravity in eight minutes. I mean, so if the sun disappeared, we'd, we'd obviously go out of orbit. But I don't think it would matter because there's no sun anyway. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. But I, you know, that's a good question. What would take longer? We would start to drift. Yeah. But I think not seeing the light would have to definitely first. All right, so TJ, we touched on this. We have two questions we like to ask, and we insist on doing it of every guest. Um, the first one, we, we talked, touched on uh, Breaking Bad a little bit. What movie or TV show gets your, your discipline right, and what gets it wrong? So Breaking Bad is one. I, it gets it, yeah, I think Breaking Bad is one of the ones that definitely gets it, like, 
not wrong necessarily, but like they, they took like I was saying, they took a lot of great time to mm -hmm. uh, make sure they are correct enough in the chemistry, right? Um, trying to trying to think, I don't know, like the so what gets it right? I think uh, a lot of oh, look at this beat, right? Yep. So you're gonna tap B, a little gentler. Yeah. Oh jeez. Stay on the Sorry. bottom. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh. That's gonna cost him some time. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna <laughs> cost a little bit. Um, I I haven't seen like Oppenheimer um, mm -hmm. yet, but I've heard that that does a really good job at talking about like science, um, and getting into it. Did you see uh, Chernobyl? I watched it's a Chernobyl. I, I really liked it. I just I ran out of time. You know, I just want to say that I don't have enough time to dedicate to. Honey beer, how fast does gravity move? I think it's it's the speed of light, is it not? Or is gravity waves are really hard to measure, I guess. <laughs> I, I think they, they measured a gravity wave by using lasers, like... Yeah. It was just like the slight change in over turn time off a mirror. I, I learned about this from an astrophysicist. So apparently on Earth, there's there's several, like, reflection systems buried, like, miles underground, right? And mm. it's just, like, mile-long tunnels that have a mirror on each end. And one of the mirrors is mobile, and if it gets hit by a gravity wave, it slightly changes the distance, so they yeah. use, like, interferometer. Mm. And they can actually triangulate where the wave came from based on those two, and it's like the, um, what do they call that? Uh, parallax, where they figure out the distance from those two detectors. Such mm -hmm. a badass experiment. Yeah. That cuddle puppy. Barbie actually does a good job talking about social science. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. There was a lot of social commentary in there, right? Well, man. Oh, non dairy says they're not underground, though. Mm -hmm. My mistake. I guess that's neutrino detectors they mm -hmm. put underground. Did you see the Barbie movie? No, I have not yet. Uh, I haven't seen that or Oppenheimer. It's kind of yeah, sad. I haven't seen either, but I have heard the, like the memes of it. I was, was going to ask you if you felt Knuff. <laughs> Knuff. Yeah. So my name has a sordid past with uh, with Ken and whatnot. So yeah. I'm going to reveal that now. Lori, here's your factoid <laughs> if you want it. So, so Ken, obviously, Ken the Barbie doll when I was younger, mm. that was a thing, right? And then there were several iterations <laughs> of like... Kenny G. It just so oh, happens yeah. my middle initial is in fact G. Oh, <laughs> wow. Kenny G aligned really nicely. And then wow. we had Kenny from South Park, and oh my god, I killed Kenny, right? <laughs> but also, uh, late 90s, uh, the group Hanson came out with the oh, song Boom Bop. Bop. Yep. Yeah. And so Hanson, obviously. And then we're, we're going full circle back to uh, uh, Ken the Barbie doll and Knuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> there's your factoid look. Yeah. Well, I, I can give you another factoid. So I was a, um, I was a percussionist for a lot of my life. So I, I did like marching band. I did DCI, which is like the highest competitive, uh, yeah, yeah. competitive marching my band. My brother did that too, actually. Oh, really? What yeah. for? He was with the Colts. No way! Yeah. I marched with the Colts for three years. Holy oh, shit! Yeah, what so years? He was he would have been like ninety eight to two thousand. Oh wow! So he was that, that was a while ago. Yeah, I did uh, two thousand nine to twenty eleven. My sisters also marched twenty uh, two thousand seven. Um, and then 2011 was my other sister's age out here, but all three of us marched in, um, oh, let me exit this way, um, in 2009. So here you're going to pick up a card and you're going to press up to go through the door, but don't press up too hard or you're going to go through the door again. Okay. So press up, but don't keep going up left. Oh, no, 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 you did it. And then you went up. So you got to do the same thing. Oh, no. Yeah, oh, so so back to that, like, music and stuff. So I was a percussionist. I did not need to know how to do this, but I can circular breathe, which is how Kenny G hold, held the longest note. Yeah. Right, through circular breathing. So. That's like hours, right? So go up, but not too oh, much. Jeez. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it's just costing him. <laughs> it's just costing me time. You're distracted. Yeah, um, but so that's one of those things that's like, that's like a funny fact. I just had to. All right. Okay. Left. Left. Like they're, they're All the way? Yeah. Okay. The, no, no, no. key card right there. That one? Oh, key yep. card. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, Lori. DCI, nice. Blue and cavies. Yeah, we went. Oh, you, nice. th those drum and bugle cores are hardcore. Like, yeah. you commit two months of training and then it like, is, tour and give shows and stuff. It is 16 hours a day, all day. You wake up, you eat, you eat and breathe it. Yeah. Um, it is an opportunity for sure and you learn a lot i actually think uh, you know a lot of the tenacity to deal with hard grad school days comes from that because uh practicing for many hours a day and like hot it's the only one you're gonna go left uh they switched it up and you're gonna shoot this rambo guy but shoot him at close range with bullets and he'll drop a green card okay 
just like that. That's actually the speed strat. There you hey, go. Yeah, card. Through the door. Nice. There you go. Okay, I'm catching up. Are you... Yeah, I got nine minutes left. Um, um, okay. Yeah, but I think that's, uh, as one of those activities, that's very, um, you know, awesome. And still going, you know, even through all the COVID and stuff. My, my one sister and her uh, husband are still involved as instructors every mm. now and then, so. Wow, that runs deep in your family, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That's a cool experience. I, I didn't do it, but I went to, like, several shows and stuff. And yeah, yeah. And it's one of those things, like, you watch the world-renowned FSU band, and it's, like, 200 people, and they can't make nearly the sound that the, the like, 50 Colts could. They, right? they cheat, I think, because they use the pyramid of sound, right? Yep. So they're they're throwing as many contras or tubas as they can. Mm -hmm. And you have a strong enough bass that builds your, like, uh, you know, your resonance yeah. to build upon it. But it's artificial. It's not, like, belting like the way the Colts did. Yeah, right. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, that's crazy. Catch up on a few things. Yeah, small world. It's huh? very small world. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Lori, Kenny G was my first concert. <laughs> oh, I'm happy for you. <laughs> Kenny G was the bane of my existence, but Ecstatica is bringing up uh, orange like Kenny. Coincidence? I am wearing orange today. That's true. Um, uh, to do... do you have the most voluble name without it being inherently goofy. That is true. My name isn't like Pubert or something like that, but... <laughs> All right. Uh, there's also uh, Eliza that's going to be in space, a much bigger scale, allowing detection of much lower frequency gravitational waves. Yeah, I suppose if you don't have to deal with anything on Earth, that makes it much easier. Um, Uncle Bill, Earth sheltered then. The images I've seen certainly have lots of stabilizing fill on the um, culvertish tunnels. Um... Lori, DCI, nice, blue, and cavies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go Haku. Kenny Loggins and Kenny Rogers. Let's not forget those. Yeah. <laughs> um, question from Non Dairy. What did you play? I played quads for most of high school. Oh, really? Yeah, I did, uh, I did quads a bit. Mainly, I did mallet percussion, so marimba, xylophone, vibraphone, things like that in DCI. But I, I've done all the percussion stuff. Really enjoy playing timpani. So you have this again. card, sorry. Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. So the way you can make up most time in this game is going to be the final boss, Mr. Big, okay. as indicated by the game cartridge description. <laughs> and I, I was so happy when I saw that on the shelf. I'm like, who carries a full yeah, right. narc? <laughs> like, narc of all things. Nope. Yeah, it was a really great retro. Why are there starts? Oh, man. Don't you remember the war on drugs? The stabby yeah. clowns? Like... <laughs> Yeah. You were too young. I was too young the for the war on drugs. Yeah, <laughs> the early I think a lot of the dare. Did, did you have to just do, say you no? Had to do dare. Yeah, yeah just yeah. say no. Yeah. Yeah. Or say no to drugs. No, yeah. it's actually on the box. So this is a... <laughs> just say no in just say no. So you guys can see it's actually affiliated with the narc cartridge. Sorry, the lights are giving it, and it's reversed. But yeah, it says just say no on the narc cartridge. Written and produced by Nancy Reagan. <laughs> Cuddle puppy. I played pipe organ in marching band. <laughs> Respect. You yeah. earned that. Every note. <laughs> the enormous weight. All right, so there's going to be a guy that comes up in a wheelchair, and you're going to shoot him with a rocket. <laughs> Is the army going to have anything to say about this? <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. It's a rocket. As soon as he gets back oh, on the screen, on. you're going to blast him with a rocket. Nice. So you're going to do it two more times. Two more times? Yep. <laughs> All right. If you guys have any last minute questions, we have approximately five to ten minutes left in this game. TJ is happy to answer anything about color chemistry, photochemistry, army research, laboratory, uh, department of defense, job opportunities, whatever you guys want to know. He's trying to focus and you can distract him as much as possible oh, so he doesn't get a good time. <laughs> yeah, we have a really bad time. We probably should have swapped to this like an hour ago. <laughs> you're doing fine. Come on. There, there you go. go. So that's two. Yep. Inch yep. warm off the screen. <laughs> One more. <laughs> All right. Another question, and you can answer this whether you want to or not. Mm. Um, unlimited budget, no moral qualms. What oh. experiment, what project would you pursue? What Manhattan project oh, thing would you induce? You could build anything. What would you do? Oh, man. I don't even... I don't know. I feel like sometimes it's just, like, so, like, just... In right, on my so wait right there, he'll drop a gold card. No, well, okay, there you go. Okay, um, what like what experiments would I do? Yeah, or what problem would you try to solve? 
This could be oh. anything. So to give you context, the developmental psychologist wants to like generate septuplets and separate them at birth. Oh my God. But the, uh, the, oh. the geographer slash ethnographer wants to put ankle bracelets on everyone and send a hurricane at a city. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> All right, so uh, for this guy, you're gonna wanna go to the top of the screen. Okay. Uh, yeah. yep. And so you, you have plenty of room if you get to the top. So move higher. His, move tongues, higher. his tongues won't hit you when you move high enough. Okay, so there's like a... Okay. And yeah, then... there's a sweet spot where you can't hit. So go, like, get away from him. And what you're going to do is you're going to turn around and you're going to jump rocket and you have to jump rocket him in the hat. All right, that has the hit point. Yep. But it has to be a jump shot and that you have to be a little bit away from him. So <laughs> get some is, distance. This is difficult. All right, he moves slower than me, so yep. that's good to know. So turn okay. around, pause, right, and yeah, yeah. jump and rocket. Yep. Just you gotta like do like that. jump tap. Get him right in the hat. <laughs> uh, Huggy Beer, is there some weird thing with the photon and a rotating mirror that's supposed to create an exotic particle or antimatter? Oof. Is there? <laughs> that is an excellent question. That is. I, don't know, I feel like a lot of these questions are like, I don't know, man, I just work here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a very like physics. I mean, the boundary of what we know. Oh, that was really close. I know. This is this is very difficult. Uh, <laughs> jump time. Ecstaticus follow up. Are they hiring at Mr. Big International? Yeah. <laughs> What's the starting salary at Mr. Mr. Big, Big International? <laughs> <laughs> is it better or worse than the 94K at ARL? I, I I'm, I'm feeling like you know ARL is probably a better uh, better choice. A lot of dubious things are going on in Mr. Big Enterprise. Yeah. So looks and also, great. do you want to live in the city that Mr. Big's at? Because we clearly saw helicopters shooting people. I mean, there's a bunch of stabbing clowns, which I think is like <laughs> yeah, a lot of wanna, people's nightmare. Ecstatic, uh, you got to really balance your uh, priorities. So why? All right, so it's just a tap for a laser. Yeah. Or for, for, a, like, for a rocket. Jeez. Sorry, it's time. Get away. So get away. Yep. And you do you jump, then hit it just like quickly. <laughs> Go, Haku. <laughs> what is the work life balance at Mr. Big International? <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing not good. <laughs> Unlimited PTO. Yeah, well, <laughs> probably good which, parental leave. <laughs> yeah, which sounds like a trap. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that was close. But that was a, a bullet, though. Yeah. That? So you're, t you're touching it, and I know way too much about this game. If you touch it more than seven frames, it gives you a bullet. That was pretty close. So a little earlier on the rock at the release. Okay. So run away, do it again. Oh, jeez. This is why this game is so dumb, and I apologize for making you play this. No, it's okay. This is, this is... There you go. There okay, now is. rock it to the face. So no jumping. Yep. Oh, no. perfect. Okay, now you're going to run away from him, and you're going to stay in like this region of the screen, and you're going to shoot bullets back at him. So get away from him. If Try. you jump, you can get away from him. Oh, him faster. Yep. Okay, okay. Yep. So now you're going to turn around, shoot bullets, but like move up and down while you shoot bullets and it's going to shoot his vertebrae out. Okay. So keep your distance, shoot backwards, keep your distance, shoot backwards. Jeez. Oh, um, what is Mr. Big throwing his, from his mouth? I just started paying attention. Uh, the answer is the first round he shoots his tongue and the second round he shoots like lasers out of his... Oh, there you go. So you got two of the vertebrae. So you just need to do that a bunch more times to get the last four. All right. I'll give you a rotating mirror is part of my early speed of light measurements to give, uh, give us a timing standard. That's interesting. Uh, quick Google, Google says it's creating an actual photon out of nothing if you rotate the mirror at the speed of light. I don't even know how to think about that. Nah, you got me on that one. Yeah. That's... Uh, that, that, I mean, it's like where the, uh, the physics and the chemistry merge, right? All right, so while TJ is finishing up with the final boss, uh, do you guys have any suggestions on people we should raid? Um, preferably science, semi-science related is usually what we go for, but we're happy to look for some retro games or people that might be interested in, uh, you know, getting a shout out from Ask a Scientist Gaming. If you guys have suggestions, throw them in quick, because TJ is very close to being this game. It doesn't feel like you it. You are, you need to do four more vertebrae, and then you need civil forfeiture level, and then you're done. It's <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Cuddle puppy, be right back. Spinning a mirror as fast as I can to break the laws of thermodynamics. <laughs> Absolutely. That's so, what we do on Ask a Scientist Gaming. So I have a question here. So I'm, I'm backing up. I'm shooting. Yep. But are they automatically... I got to get way further. Yeah, like get some distance. Stay in this region. You're a little too high to shoot him. Okay. okay. So now it's... So stop there. He's going to come. Basically move up and down a little bit. 
eventually you're gonna hit one of those vertebrae. And there's a really particular way you have to do this on the speed run. There's a position you have to be, but you're not gonna hit that position, so you kind of have to get lucky on this. Oh, jeez. This is very uh, humbling. <laughs> Huggy beer. Cuddle puppy, in this stream we obey the laws of thermodynamics, absolutely. <laughs> I wear a leather jacket and sunglasses indoors. You can't control me. <laughs> oh, go Haku. Any famous chemists on TikTok? Are you a TikToker? I am not a TikToker. We're actually not a lot of TikTok. I was going to say that banned in the DoD, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's suggested not to have it. Oh, really? So yeah. FSU is flat out banned. It. Yeah, I thought you can't access it on the, uh, nope. on the Wi-Fi, right? Oh, there you go. You got one of them. Got one of them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Dynamics owes me money. I'm not listening to her anymore. <laughs> it's important to take a stand ecstatic. <laughs> uh, That's funny. Yeah, no. Um, there are, I mean, there are famous like scientists a lot of people will use um, that talk about, I think, like Hank Green's like a, a big oh, science go. communicator. Go right. Go. Oh, okay, go. Right. Um, I think if you're looking for like a, a, a person who does, you know, like science-y content, he's a pretty good one. Let's see if there's any science streamers on. Moodle is always on Wednesday nights late. Is there anyone else? Nerduino? So yeah, this is civil forfeiture the level where you're oh. skating their gold with no due process. I feel like there's like an interesting... Yeah, because civil, civil assets forfeiture is not like... I'm confused on the, the, the messaging here. <laughs> 2140. Is that it? All right. I think that puts you in the top 10. Maybe oh, so top I didn't 15. need to collect all that gold. I could no. just keep going. No, I just <laughs> walk right and find the door. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this is the time with walking most of the bridge. Yeah, if the car didn't blow up, you would have had a. You probably would have saved two minutes on that time. You would have been really competitive with uh, no. some of the top runners. So, no pressure. Yeah. Well, I got. I got a. Uh... Well, now you get to put your. Oh, I get to put my initials. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Yeah. Immortalized on Ask a Scientist Gaming. This YouTube video will exist for as long as YouTube exists. <laughs> All right. There you go. Perfect. Then just end. Yep. Classic arcade with the mutated finger. Yep. <laughs> All right. All DJ, right. was that everything you hoped it would be? <laughs> it, um, less stressful than I thought it would be. Um, <laughs> it's hard to play video games and talk science, but I'm, I'm glad to give. I have the opportunity to do so. So thanks for having me. Yeah, and it's, it's been great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's been a really fun stream. We've had a lot of questions ranging from generation of photon from spinning mirrors to making out with fish. Um, yeah, not not necessarily what you Back expected. Yeah. Uh, Army officer that's looking at this, I hope you enjoyed the journey. <laughs> <laughs> TJ, any parting words for the audience? Oh, man. I, I, that was not on the list of things to prepare, but... <laughs> it was uh, not. I you know, I think... You know, if anyone's interested in doing science, especially in undergraduate level, undergraduate research is a must. I think that was one of the things that made my career to where I got to. So highly recommend doing it, rotating through labs, stuff like that, and just trying to go out and do research. Huh? Oh, hey, before that... we close, Gohaku yeah. has one more. Favorite yeah. chemistry formula, or we'll say favorite equation in general. Oh, man. I, a chemical, I think the... What do they always say? The 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 chemist favorite uh, C C two uh, H um, yeah C two H um, H five O H right? So alcohol is every chemist <laughs> uh, uh, alcohol is every chemist favorite solution. That's fair. <laughs> no, that's a that's a horrible one. We, but we actually uh, have the ethanol emote. So yeah, <laughs> that counts. Yeah. Uh, no, I think um, I don't know. There's like a formula. I think I think what really is, is um, second law of thermodynamics. Or no. Yeah, no, first law of thermodynamics, the energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's a very interesting thing to think about mm -hmm. is that we all come from somewhere. The energy that we have came from somewhere. So, and the energy we give off will, will go do something. So I think the first law of thermodynamics is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. We obey those rules in the yeah, screen. Always. <laughs> yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. TJ, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been awesome talking through yeah. and congratulations on winning the war on drugs. Yeah. As well as living <laughs> through the Halo 1 nostalgia, which is oh, a lot of so fun. Good, it, the, the best levels. It, yeah. It's absolutely classic. Thank you, yeah. everyone. Um, in two weeks, our next guest on September 20th will be Dr. Wally Boot. Wally is a cognitive psychologist. He actually uses video games in particular elderly in terms of how they uh, deal with drive 
driving and cognitive abilities related to driving. And so, uh, yeah, join us with Dr. Wally Boot. That should be a lot of fun. That's September 20th. That's two weeks from now on Wednesday night, 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern. I should probably add Eastern to that clock. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Nandari says, thank you, TJ. Good luck in boot camp. Yeah. <laughs> Might as well do it just for fun, yeah. right? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> All right. I think we're going to raid. So again, thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. It's, it's always a great time on Ask a Scientist Gaming. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys again in a couple weeks. But until then, we'll see you guys later. Yeah, thank you.